All right. Hello, analysts. Welcome to the opening event, the, I would say the inauguration event of the European Association of Crime Analysts. I'm more than happy to have you guys here on board. And I give you a, a little history about what happened in the last month. So as a member with the Austrian Federal Police uh, and the Crime Analysis Unit since uh, now 17 years, uh, I was uh, uh, involved for many years now uh, with IECA, the International Association of Crime Analysts. Uh, these guys, they learned me most of the stuff I know now. And I was also honored to, uh, to chair the European subcommittee for ICA. But then we found out uh, it might be more important to set up uh, an association especially focused for the European scene, uh, focused also on the European uh, law system and the special needs of people who work and study as uh, crime analysts, as researchers or whatever, students, um, because sometimes uh, we found out that there is a, a lack uh, in focusing on the European stuff. But on the other hand, not only uh, creating a European association, also be open for everyone in the world uh, because we have to work together. We have to be connected together. And this is uh, why I'm so happy about that, uh, that ICA uh, will be also on board today will also give you uh, a little information about what's going on on ICA stuff. And hopefully we can collaborate very, very close in the, in the near future. Uh, anyway, uh, as we set it up, the European Association of Crime Analysts, I had a lot of help from, from friends I know now for years from the field, but especially I will point out one guy who will talk to you in, in some minutes. It's Andreas Melinato, uh, the director of the European Forensic Institute and his team. Uh, they were so helpful uh, and assisting me in all that stuff I needed uh, to make this happen today. And coming to collaborations, uh, the near future will also bring some nice opportunities for you guys. And I hope you will follow us uh, on the website and also on the discussion forums. Nice opportunities for you uh, to get some additional uh, benefits out from EACA with the help from the Euro European Forensic Institute. So stay tuned, guys. Uh, there is a lot of good stuff coming up, uh, but also, Check out what IECA can do for you. And yes, uh, at the moment, I don't. I only have to say some uh, administrative stuff. Uh, when people uh, are talking to you, giving you presentations, you will be able to ask questions uh, by using uh, the Q and A box. Plus, if there is not enough time to answer them at the end uh, of uh, this event, or if there's also not enough time uh, by mail. But uh, I promise you, you will get all the answers you may need. So uh, ask questions, but give us a little time to answer them. Um, at the end, uh, I'm more than happy uh, that we also have a special guest on board. Uh, uh, I don't want to say the name now. Uh, Andreas Merinato will introduce uh, this uh, special guest to us. But now uh, I will hand over to Michelle uh, if there is anything additional about any administration stuff or are we okay that we can switch to Annie Mitchell, the vice president. 
Michelle, uh, just a second for you, if there is anything you may add for administration. Hi, a very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this lovely afternoon or morning, uh, wherever you are. Um, on the administration side, it's just if you have any questions, feel free to send in your questions on the Q&A box, as mentioned um, by Sam earlier. That's all from, from my end. Um, and I just wanted to share this one video from the International Association of Crime Analysts from Annie and Mary. Um, enjoy the video. The International Association of Crime Analysts is actively committed to serving crime and intelligence analysts all over the world. With over 5,000 members, we are actively expanding our membership and developing our services. Our certification program sets a high standard for analysts globally. The Law Enforcement Analysts Foundation, or LEAF, and the Certified Law Enforcement Analysts, or CLIA programs, provide accreditation for both entry-level and experienced analysts. We also facilitate coaching and mentoring for our members. The IACA's professional training series provides analysts with all the skills they need, offering classes online and in-person in tactical analysis, problem analysis, computer applications, crime mapping, and much more. In addition, our annual conferences and symposiums provide unique professional development and networking opportunities. There are millions of federal, state, and local law enforcement officers working across the globe. With so many people dedicated to protecting its citizens, it can be easy for analysts to feel overlooked. Without the hard work of these analysts, police officers wouldn't be able to do their jobs as effectively, and this is especially true today. Crime analysts collect and analyze data from various sources and locations. It could include anything from police records to government statistics, or even social media networks. Whatever it takes, to gain insight into criminal activity, so those police departments can better understand what's going on in their communities. The information they uncover is used to help inform police officers about how they can most effectively fight crime, as well as inform citizens on how they can protect themselves against it. Identifying trends in criminal behavior helps law enforcement predict when and where crimes might occur, which allows them to allocate resources where they are needed. We support our regional associations and chapters across the globe. We are happy to welcome the European Association of Crime Analysts to our growing community. We hope you enjoy this event and we look forward to continuing our support for our members. Well, hello, ECAC, hello Europeans. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here and excited about this, um, this new venture that Sam has started. I've known Sam for quite a while. So I'm Annie Mitchell. I am currently the Vice President of Administration for the International Association of Crime Analysts. Um, my experience as an analyst, I retired from the, reti from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department as a supervising crime analyst and training coordinator. Um, this is a passion of mine, this profession. I started back in the early humble beginnings of crime analysis and have watched it grow. And I have watched not only the profession grow, but I've watched the IACA grow. Um, right now, we are the largest professional association of crime analysts in the world with over 5,200 members. I'm very, very excited about that. We have been um, working to bring on, on board as many uh, people from as many countries as we possibly can. Um, right now, our members represent over 70 countries. And we are interested in bringing more, especially from Europe. And um, I have actually a, a small little personal story on, um, I, even though I'm retired, I will still hear from people from my department, detectives and analysts. And I had a detective reach out to me because he had someone here in California is where I am at, um, that was from Denmark and he, he called me and he said, Annie, you can find anybody. I need a picture of this guy. Do you know anybody in Denmark? Well, that is one of the huge advantages. One of the very simple thing, but what a huge advantage being a member is we have a directory of all of these 5,200 members. So I simply went on and within two minutes, I had um, three sworn detectives in Denmark and I gave him the information and 
he got his picture. So uh, that is just one of the very small things that we do. We have a uh, wonderful training program and we keep growing it as, as the needs come in, right? Technology and everything is, is just, you know, it just keeps growing and growing. Um, and we have a webinar library that is free to our members. Um, we offer multiple 12 week specialty training classes, um, some of which prepare students for the IACA analyst certification exams. We have a two tiered certification program with an entry level exam having been recently translated into Spanish, and we are working on two other languages at the moment. We're an all volunteer organization. So some of the things, some of our committee members, they're also working. Some things are a little bit slower than we would like, but we are working on that. So we do an annual training conference. And this year we were in Chicago, Illinois. We had over 600 attendees representing 44 states in the United States and nine different countries represented. We had Australia, Canada, Colombia, Ecuador, Iceland, Mexico, Montenegro, Turkey, and the UK. There were also 27 different companies demonstrating their products in our exhibitor hall. Um, one of the things that you need as an analyst, one of the easiest things and the best things you can have, and it doesn't cost you any sort of time in training, is our ability to network. I would not have been the analyst that I became or the supervisor I became without the help of all of the people, all of the individuals that I would reach out to on a regular basis. So I want you all, I invite all of you to explore our website and see, you know, see what you think and join if you will. And I also want to, um, I'm looking forward to this, this, um, this little symposium here today, we have, you have some outstanding, outstanding speakers. So with that being said, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for, for, um, for coming and bringing in all of your, all of the good stuff that you have. And I love to hear all of it too, even though I'm still not a working analyst, but I'm, like I said, passionate. So thank you, Sam, so much. And everyone sit back and enjoy the day. Thank you so much, Penny. Uh, really appreciate that you give us a, a speech at the very beginning uh, to introduce the ICA. And yeah, your level is very high. And uh, I promise you uh, the European Association will try to come a little bit closer to the level you guys already have. And this will only work uh, if we collaborate together because we are also planning uh, uh, very special trainings focused especially on Europe. We will also uh, set up master's training uh, at the European Forensic Institute. Andreas will talk about that later. And this, for example, might also be a good opportunity for ICA members to get a, a European view of, of what the crime analyst can do and maybe we will find also one or two or even more students who will join our partner university. Um, thank you again, Annie. Please uh, stay tuned. Don't leave us now uh, because there are so many uh, speakers. Uh, uh, I love that they are here now and, and joining us and helping us out with their, with their presentations, which is so highly appreciated. And now uh, I'm handing over the floor to Andreas Melinato, my friend from Italy, uh, working as the director of the European Forensic Institute in Malta. Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. A very good afternoon to the Honorable Minister for Justice of the Republic of Malta, Dr. Jonathan Attar, distinguished guests, President and Vice President of the International Association of Prime Analysts, uh, Mary Bertuccelli and Annie Mitchell, our highly noticeable speakers today, my fellow colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, to Sam Inspector Steiner, President and Founder of the uh, uh, European Association of Prime Analysts, 
I would like to say thank you, not only for being our gracious host today, but also for creating this European chapter for crime analysts. This is a truly unique platform for European professional in crime analysis to come together, connect and learn from each other. We from the European Forensic Institute are honored to support you in this project as the official educational partner of the European Association of Crime Analysts. Uh, the European Forensic Institute was founded with the first and foremost aim to create a European hub for forensic and investigative sciences to bring together experts, professionals, and students to collaborate, teach, learn, and innovate in this highly important and pertinent sector. We do this through our fully accredited blended learning programs, taking advantage of the benefits of remote learning and hands-on experience. The work around crime analysis requires the collaboration of experts from across all the increasingly interconnected and continuously advancing sectors, ranging from forensic sciences, criminology, and profiling to engineering, digital forensics, IT, and today's complex business and financial systems. To support our shared values and our shared ambitions in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, quality education, peace, justice, and strong institution partnership, we must continue to collaborate. Uh, to bridge the gap not only between academia and the profession, but also across all professions in the public and private sector. As such, the European Association for Crime Analysts has the foremost opportunity to play a pivotal role in bringing together all parties and make a tangible impact against crime. This is a challenge we must all aspire to triumph over because, as we know, today crime and criminals are absolutely have absolutely no borders, and neither should we. To this end, I'm proud to announce our new research center dedicated to cybersecurity, digital forensics, and crime analysis, led by Inspector Steiner. The research center is an active part of the European Forensic Institute based in Malta and offering to Malta an international and central role in all these interconnected fields. Among the goals set out for this research center include developing research projects in cybersecurity, digital forensics and crime analysis, promoting the research and results internationally creating tangible co co collaboration among academics, professionals, companies, and relevant parties, and organizing events, conferences, and or training online and in, in person. In the pipeline, our staff are working preparing the groundwork for the next research center in the field of financial crime. Finally, myself and my team at the European Forensic Institute are ready to take on the continued challenges in bridging the gap to support our shared values. We are always ready to hear about your next groundbreaking proposal, so do not hesitate to get in touch with us. Sam, thank you for, your, for creating this association and good luck for your new role of director of the Research uh, Center for Cybersecurity, Digital Forensics and Crime Analysis at the European Forensic Institute. I'm sure our partnership will continue to strengthen and we will be able to achieve the goals and challenges we have set out. I now hand over back to you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much, Andreas. Uh, I really appreciate that we both are not only collaborating together, I think, we also became friends in the last month. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, that's really, really great because you are one guy and not only you, also your team, I can count on you every time and this is great. So uh, when I'm checking the watch, uh, I can see that we are approximately 10 minutes too early now for the next speaker. Uh, I would like to ask Rachel, do you want to start now and uh, start your presentation now? So there are some possibilities for the people uh, to ask questions and we can answer them right after your speech. 
or anyway, you may extend uh, your presentation now for around 40 minutes, which makes it easier, in my opinion, for you. Uh, Sam, whatever you want to do, I'm I'm ready and willing to start now. Um, people who, if anybody, I know Annie knows me and, and, and the rest of you know, I can talk for 15 minutes or I can talk for three hours about crime analysis. So, um, uh, you know, <laughs> what I'm I can sure do is- You can talk for years, not only for- <laughs> 30 minutes. Um, I think I have, I think I have talked for years. Um, yeah, good. let's go ahead and get started. I don't know if you wanted to say anything else before I... Uh, yes, uh, I just want uh, to introduce you to the audience. Uh, I, I think you're one of the best known uh, uh, experts in the world, if not the best known. Uh, it's my personal opinion, but I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, many people around the world, they don't know only you, they also know uh, the Bible you wrote. Uh, it's the Bible for every crime analyst and for everyone who wants to become a crime analyst. I'm pretty sure you can also uh, say some words about the, your book and the new version you already published. Uh, yeah, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, Rachel, and so many uh, thanks to you. Uh, I'm so proud that I have you on board now, and that's really a, a great honor. Thank you so much, and let's go. All right. Well, thank you, Sam. Um, and I'm not sure I, we, we've known each other for a long time. I think um, when you first started in, in crime analysis, you had such a presence, and uh, we met at a couple of conferences, although 17 years ago, right? Well, just a, a little bit about me. Um, since I may not have met, or some of you, most of you, I probably haven't met, um, but I am obviously Rachel Santos, and and um, some of you may, I know Nat, uh, Annie knew me at first as, as Rachel Boba, and I'll talk a little bit about how that, how Santos is now important in um, my life, but I started in crime analysis, I hate to say this, in 1994, as a part-time analyst in Arizona, in Tempe, Arizona, USA. And I was working on my PhD and I had an opportunity to do some, I had somebody come in my office and some of you may know Noah Fritz and he came into my office. I was a graduate student and said, hey, you know, we have some uh, positions here at the police department. We'd like to bring some graduate students in to help our crime analysis unit. Um, and I said, all right, what the heck? I, I was." had no idea what crime analysis was necessarily, but I had statistics. I had been a TA for uh, research methods, used SPSS and everything. So I said, all right, cool. So I applied and I got the position and I worked 20 hours a week for about, I don't know, nine or 10 months before I had the opportunity to get the full-time position, which changed my whole trajectory in life. And, and some of the folks I worked with at the time, besides Noah Fritz, um, some of you may know Sean Baer and Paul Bentley. So th they were the analysts. So we had our, our crew and I was, I then became an analyst and worked for about four years, five years until uh, 19, at the end of 1999 when I, ha I had, I'd say opportunities because um, I got to know a lot of people. And through that positions opened up or they, they kind of grabbed me and said, hey, are you interested? I took a chance and went to the police foundation, which is now the National Policing Institute, um, and was in charge of the crime mapping laboratory there. And really what, you know, it sounds like mapping, but I really took it on myself to create more than just mapping, but crime analysis, problem analysis. And I was able to work with and, and train and, and go across the country and internationally um, working with crime analysts. Actually, um, went to Turkey, went to different places. Um, and after being in DC for about three or four years and writing grants and working on grants, I said, well, you know, that's kind of a, a tough, a high profile, a high, high level of stress job. So I got an opportunity again through connections and crime analysis to go to Florida and um, be a professor there, which gave me, um, gave me the time and the luxury to write my book. Um, and that was first in two, you know, 2005. And um, I wanted, that was the first time I really wanted to write down what I knew about crime analysis, all the work that I had done across the country. Um, and so that was the first edition. And as Sam said, the, the fifth edition 
um, has just come out in February. And I have every year, well, I think about the third edition, I started putting all kinds of international examples because it was important to not only me, to the publisher, to the, the field, to put in um, examples from around the world uh, as kind of highlights to the different concepts. My book, it, in my book, and I just want to say this real quickly, what I focus on in the book are the fundamental concepts, which honestly haven't changed much since I started as a crime analyst, um, in terms of the, 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 the logic, the thought, the statistics, the, the way we apply versus the technology. So my book, if you want my book, it's not about technology because I'm, you know, as you know, as soon as we write anything down and try to publish anything on tech, it's different. It's changed, especially these days. So, so, um, and, and I'll talk about some of the concepts uh, today. I'm not going to get in too much detail, kind of go to a 30,000 foot view, uh, crime analysis and the role of policing. But um, so from that in, in Florida, I wrote the book and then I uh, somehow, so, well, I started working with an agency and I met my husband who was a police sergeant at the time and eventually became a, uh, a commander. We were friends for a long time and um, had a, a grant that's, that the whole goal of the grant was to institutionalize crime analysis in a police department. And so thinking through that process, so how do we institutionalize crime analysis? And being an organized person that I am and an analyst at heart, uh, I started organizing, thinking about how we can apply, what are the different things that analysts do? What are the different levels? How do we um, apply it to crime reduction? And came up with a, an approach from an analysis point of view and the products based on things that we've done. and. Um, through this grant with the police department, um, I started working with Roberto, my husband, before he was my husband, and we started implementing these things. So he was the sworn side. He took the analysis. He tried to implement it on when he was on midnight shift, when he was on day shift. He eventually became crime the, the supervisor of the crime analysts, and he, was, he did that for 10 years as a commander, and he worked directly for the chief, and we institutionalized and implemented um, and institutionalized crime analysis throughout the agency. So that approach is what I'm going to talk about today, um, because since then, this is about 15 years ago, since then we have refined it, we have written a book on it, we have implemented it in agencies across the United States, we'd love to you know, expand um, and, and get it to other places. I know we've talked to different countries and um, it's called Stratify Policing. And I think what I'm gonna hit today is how important and how the core of it is crime analysis. And you cannot do this approach. It's basically a business model for a police department, not just a crime analysis unit, for a police department to implement crime proactive crime reduction. And um, I'm going to hit it from an angle, from crime analysis angle, because who I'm talking to, but also um, because it's fundamental. We can't do it without it. And actually, the agencies we work with, if they don't have crime analysts, um, we say, you know, call us back when you have one, because you can't do this without it. So with that, I think that's my, well, oh, actually, right now, let me, um, the, right now I'm in, in um, Virginia, so from Florida. My husband retired, he got his PhD before he retired, which gave us another opportunity to come up here to Southwest Virginia and the Appalachian Mountains is gorgeous. Anybody wants to come here in the fall uh, from Europe? This is, you know, you look at pictures of the Appalachian Trail and, and the Blue Ridge Parkway, that's where we live and feel very, um, we're very happy up here. So we're professors at Radford University. We have a Center for Police Practice Policy and Research. I'll show you the slide here in a second when I go to sharing my screen. Um, and so we, I, I teach, I have a crime analysis minor, we have a crime analysis certificate, we get our students all around the, the country here, and I know I have some students that love to go to Europe um, and be analysts, but uh, so that's kind of what, what I do now. So without anything, uh, without further ado, sorry, a long introduction there, but I think it's important because I have the, you know, I, I'm a professor, but uh, one of the, I think one of my strengths is I came from crime analysis. And honestly, my degree is in sociology, and it was not in, I think I've taken one course in um, policing. What All that I know in, in policing, and obviously after um, being in the field and, and studying it and, and doing all that, is is the, the core of what I what I do and what I know is, is working in a police department and being an analyst. So everything I do, I try to be practical. Obviously, my husband be having a PhD and being a, a, a commander in a police department. Everything we do is is about 
and being uh, implementation. We've done some research ourselves. We've done some high level random control trials that we did a, a two year blind experiment on uh, looking at patterns and implementation of, of short term crime patterns, micro time hotspots. But, you know, we're all about translating and I'll talk about that too. translating the research into into practice. So let me go ahead and um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this works with the um, and maybe someone can tell me make sure that this is this is actually working um, so everybody can see yes, it. It's working Rachel. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. All right, so I'll give you my contact information at the end here uh, with my email uh, and then you can take a, a screenshot but that's just a picture of my uh, my uh, the the book the the most recent um, book but again I'll have some info on the back on the back end too so like I said in Rad Radford University we have a center there and what I'm going to talk today about is the central role of crime analysis in effective um, proactive policing so let's start um, I think what's important is you know having evidence, right? And, and doing practices and have police important because that's our field, right? Assisting police. It's important for police to do what they do based on evidence and not just based on experience and based on what they've always done. Um, so, but what's important too is that to be based on evidence, we can't just as researchers, a lot of researchers, they'll do the research, they'll find things that work. And then, um, researchers don't have police experience, right? They don't have that, that organizational experience or even the culture of policing to understand and, and, and translate that into practice. So we wrote, an, my husband and I wrote an article a few years ago and published this and really um, it was a, a journal, a special issue that David Weisberg from George Mason and his graduate students put together on uh, translational criminology. So we sat down and said, okay, how does our work relate to the um, evidence-based policing, the idea of what works, um, and how, how does that relate? So we, th we thought through, and we came up with the, the idea, and now this is actually in a book chapter. It's a book chapter in a, a book called Transforming the Police by David and his, his graduate students. They took and they, they made a whole book on this um, with a lot of great, great work, great chapters. But what we came up with is this four-phase process. And just thinking through, again, I'm an analyst at heart, so organized. Um, we, we organized and thought through what this process looks like. So in, in the four phases, we've got research, right? Peer research, and does it work? So we have studies, we have experiments, the Campbell Collaboration, um, which which is based in, and has a certain criteria, right, for what research we take and we look at. So we want to look at experiments, um, random control trials. We want to use uh, high-level quasi-experiments. We want to use systematic, well, systematic or, or actually high-quality evaluation research um, to determine whether different strategies work. And when I'm talking here, strategies obviously can apply to anything in policing or in the world, but here I'm going to talk about crime reduction throughout. So we have all kinds of stuff on on different methods, different ways that police, uh, different ways that researchers kind of want to look at uh, how police can reduce crime. One, we know they can reduce crime. And it, two, we know it, it's more than answering calls and, and uh, investigating crimes. In fact, we do know that just answering calls and investigating crimes does not reduce crime and will never reduce crime um, because it's not enough. So we have studies, phase one is that pure research, we're, we're, we're doing the work, we're implementing and evaluating and doing random control trials. Now we have to work with police to do that, but it's really the researchers that lead that. Police have to be open, which over the years has gotten much, much better. The second phase is now what works. And this is kind of where going back to the Campbell collaboration and how they have a methodology, what they consider is a high level, high quality research study and there's a systematic methodology, meta-analysis, right, to take all those studies on a particular topic and decide and, and come up with conclusions about what works. So what it's not good enough, just like in anything in medicine, um, you know, if you take a, a, a drug or there's a procedure or a treatment, you don't want it to be based just on one study. Uh, you want there to be multiple studies. You want them to have high quality studies looking at different people, different ways to determine what works, what's the best treatment. And so that's really phase two. So phase two is kind of a, a, an exercise in meta-analysis of the work that's done in phase one. 
Now, and, and we've been doing this, and, and Larry Sherman started this in the University of Maryland with a huge project in around 1997, where they went through and, and looked at a whole bunch of different things. And since then, um, those, those types of evaluations and what works and that, that evidence has been collected and put together. 2017, there was a report on um, that, that was all put together. I would recommend that. Um, I don't have a picture of it here. Normally, I do. Uh, it's it's uh, proactive, the effect of policing and proactive, uh, proactive policing and crime on crime and communities. And so this is kind of a, it's, it's a review. It's actually very, there's an executive summary. It's about 200 pages. That's a really good uh, book and a reference about what works in um, crime reduction. The third, the third phase here now, and, and most researchers will stop right at phase two. That's really, hey, look, we've got the results. This is what works. Here you go, police. But that's actually the first step for police is deciding and seeing what the evidence is. The, the more important and the, the hands on the ground and, and um, really making it work is, well, first we have to know how to make it work, right? So to do that, and I'll just take a quick example with hotspots policing, or you can even take intelligence led policing. So hotspots policing, we know that works. Systematically, right, we identify high uh, high uh, disproportionate levels of crime. We respond in different ways, different things work, and um, it can reduce crime. We tell that to a police department and they say, okay, how do you make that work? How do you make it work where it's consistent, where it's done over time, where it can be sustained? Who does it? Who identifies the hotspots? Well, we could say crime analysis, right? Okay, but what is a hotspot in our area, in our city? What is, you know, what kind of crime are we going to look at? Okay, once we identify that, Who's in charge of making sure people respond? Who actually responds? What kind of responses do we do? Even such as if we know directed patrol is effective in uh, um, hotspots policing shows it's effective, what does directed patrol look like? Does directed patrol mean officers drive around? Do they walk around? Do they ride bicycles? We know from research that if they go in and out, right, 10 minutes, 15 minutes in these areas and out and in and out and in and out, that's more effective than um sitting under a tree for two hours but how do we get officers to do that how do we get officers to go in those areas and not where they want to go where they think the crime is and trust the analysis so this is this phase two is really um really significant in in terms of putting things on the ground and making sure it works and that's what i'm going to talk about today because because roberto and i have come up with a business model of how to make it work how taking what we know works and how to make that work in a, in a police department. And the last phase here too is of course, making it work. And this is up to the police. This is saying, okay, we can come up with a business model and we can help you, we can train you, we can, we can translate what works, but you, meaning the police, the police leaders, leaders at every level, not just leaders as, as the, you know, say the superintendent, the chief, the sheriff, uh, the people at the top, how how it's it's every leader at every level. How do they make that work in the agency? How do they keep that sustainable, right? And and so that's what I'm going to talk about today a little bit. This phase two, or I'm sorry, that should be phase three, not phase two. How did that happen? But um, and phase four. So this is one, two, three, and four. I apologize for that. All right. So let's let's just talk quickly about what works. And I think, um, you know, those of you who've read the report and we kind of see, and what, what's nice about that report, it puts things into categories. I'm not gonna go into all the different, um, the, uh, the different strategies within each category, but um, you'll see by the end um, what's important here. So, so we know what works, we have place-based approaches. And that's why I spoke about, you know, hotspots policing, uh, where they're short-term putting police officers in an area or identifying small areas and even doing longer term problem solving approaches, right? Trying to reduce opportunities, um, the routine activities, seeing what's going on and how within places we can reduce crime. We also know that, that place-based approaches do not displace crime. Research has, has done, uh, researchers have, every time they look at um, place-based approaches, they're gonna look for displacement, spatial displacement, and that does not occur because we're changing opportunities. When we're effective, the police change opportunities and crimes do not just go one for one. They don't just move around the corner. And we know that to be true. We also, another category is the person-focused approaches. So these are where we have, we know from research that um, a small proportion of 
Um, just like a small proportion of addresses or are, are in areas account for a lot of the crime. Same thing with people. We have chronic offenders, and I don't care if that's in um, that's in Texas or that's in Spain. Um, we we know this to be true. There's been so much research here in the United States and in Europe and Australia and different places that you know we can identify chronic offenders, long term offenders. Then um, there are certain responses, focus deterrence, some other things, depending on the, the type of offender that that is also effective, right? It's also effective. The third thing here is community-based approaches. And what we know and what the research shows us with these meta-analyses and this report it tells us is that community-based approaches can, not necessarily, they're not as effective at reducing crime as place-based and person-focused, but they are effective in increasing trust and the legitimacy of the police. So when we, and not all the, the, the strategies are, effective at any of these levels, but they do know and they have identified the ones that are. And what is important about that is for every every strategy, place-based, person-focused strategy that we do, um, what we want to do also is do a community-based approach. So it's not just enough to go into a, a high crime area, we call I call a problem area, and uh, send police in there and do effective directed patrol. We also, part of that directed patrol is talking to citizens in a positive way, right? Having a positive interaction. Hey, you know that there's crime here. Um, you know, we're here to help. Have you seen anything? Um, and do those types of things. And in, in areas, and I don't care where you are, and, and, and I think policing and communities are same across the world, is that there are some areas that, uh, some neighborhoods and areas in, in your cities and your, in your, and even in the countryside that, that this, this is more of a challenge than in others, right? So we're always, it's like a relationship. I talk, Roberto and I do this training and we always um, joke about um, being married, right? So it, a lot of kids think, I say kids, you know, people in their 20s get married and they're done. That's it, we got married, no more work on the relationship. But we know that's not true. Marriage, all the work starts with, with the, the wedding. And so with the community-based approach, that's the relationship between the police and the community. And it's always something that police have to work on. So what we know about that too, as we're working on it and they are, as these community-based approaches are incorporated into the play space and person focus, when we have a better relationship with the community, um, crime reduction is easier because we have more cooperation. They're looking more positively, maybe not completely positive, but more positively with, at the police in terms of what they can do. And this has been a struggle everywhere in the last few years, right? With um, with all the issues and, and the political rhetoric um, and, and police have, have struggled, but it's always an approach and it ebbs and flows or approach. It's always a concern. It's always a relationship that has to be worked on. Um, so, so we wanna combine these. And the last thing here that, that we know that's effective is the problem solving process. So the scan, analyze, respond and assess, you know, the idea of John, that John Eck came up with in the, the, um, the late eighties, early nineties, that, that police, when we're addressing problems, whether they're short-term problems, whether they're long-term problems, that we use the SARA process, which is scanning, analyzing, responding and assessing again, um, and what's important about that is police often go, and this is the critique, they go from scanning to responding. And that analysis piece, as you know, as we know as crime analysts, the analysis piece is what's the struggle as well as the evaluation. Um, so we know this is effective. There have been a ton of different studies, a ton of different ways to implement, and, and England in particular has had so many projects. We have the Herman Goldstein Awards. You have the Nick Tilly Awards for problem solving. But it's more than just the awards. It's more than just individual projects. It's about this is the way police should do crime reduction. And the, the most important thing here, and I'll, I'll just summarize the slide, and I think it's obvious for us, and we talk about this with police too, every single one of these the most important thing and what the research, the report shows is it has to be focused. Whatever police do, we can't just do things generally. We can't just do the same strategy for every different type of problem. It has to be focused. We have to you know, dig down. We have to prioritize what we're doing. And the only way to do that is through analysis, is through systematic crime analysis. We can't do that just through experience. We can't do that even a police leader who's been working in an agency for 20 years doesn't know where the crime and the problems are happening yesterday or this week and may understand where the high crime areas are, but why is it a high crime area? What's been going on recently? We know that crime analysis is integral to all of these things, obviously with problem solving process, 
but we have to, for police to be effective, they have to be focused. All right. So that's, that's just the foundation of what we know from um, what we found out through research and what works. So to just talk about that a little bit more though, um, and I'll just take a drink here, is that what is the role of crime analysis in, in, in crime reduction? And I think this is important because I obviously we need it, it's fundamental. And every, every type of approach, we're focusing in using analysis, but part of the making it work and I think that one of the challenges and one of the pitfalls that police leaders come up with is that they assume that get, getting a crime analyst and getting the software, or maybe just getting technology and software, they don't even need an analyst, which don't get me talking about that. I'll talk about that forever. But um, getting an analyst, that solves the problem. So, OK, we're going to do analysis. We're going to get some maps. We're, and even if it's effective analysis, even if it's the best analysis in the whole world, we're going to take it. And we're going to put it out um, and everybody's going to reduce crime. We're going to identify hotspots. We're going to, we get it down to the, you know, the analysts are spending a lot of time on this. They're doing really good work. We're going to put it out there. The cops will go there and they'll reduce crime. Well, I think you guys all know that's not true because I think what, no matter where you are in the world, you, there are frustrations that crime analysts have that they put stuff out and they don't know what happens to it. They don't know if people are using it or not. They don't know if people are being held accountable for using it. Um, so I think what's important, and we talk about this with analyst, with police chiefs a lot and the, and the police leaders, is let's make sure we understand what the role of crime analysis is and crime reduction, not overplay it, but not underplay it. And this all goes back to the, the problem solving process and how integral crime analysis is. So let's talk about it. I just want to make an analogy to medicine um, and just give you kind of a quick example. Um, so if we take medicine and, you know, kind of the, as the, the, the profession or the, the overall purpose to, to cure people, to diagnose, to cure people. And then let's, let's um, analogize that to crime reduction. So we have a patient in medicine and in uh, for crime reduction, it's a community as our patient. We're trying to fix and we're trying to help the community and reduce crime and make it better. So let's just take a quick example. I talk about this in my book too. And I just, it's just such a good um, a way of relating and so say we have an MRI, which is that machine that really looks at every single um, bit of your body, right? They'll go in and it can see the veins, it can see the arteries, it can see the bones, it can see the fibers, everything. Um, and an MRI, when you go do an MRI, it's a big, huge machine, right? Collects all kinds of data. There's a person at the computer in the other room because it's electronic or, right, you know, has some, um, uh, some radiology or has some, you know, the x-ray process, sorry, I can't think of that word, um, in that. And so they take, and they take this picture, right? And so in, in crime reduction in police departments, we have the data and the software that allow the data obviously comes from um, the police and from the community and the MRI that brings data from the body, uh, from our patient. So, and we have software. But uh, as you know, I've had a couple of MRIs myself. As you know, you always wanna ask that technician, the person working the computer to say, hey, give me the results, what it, what it looked like. And they said, I can't, I can't say anything. I'm just a technician. I can't do anything. So what happens there is that in with the MRI, it goes to the radiologist, right? And the radiologist, who is a radiologist? I always ask this question. It's funny how people don't know. A radiologist is not just a technician who looks at the results. A radiologist is a doctor, a, a fully trained doctor who went to four years, at least four years of medical school and did a residency and all they know and all they do every day is look at MRIs and look at x-rays and, and interpret those, right? And so if we take that analogy, that's crime analysis. That's what we do. We are that doctor, the medical doctor that looks at a certain thing and we are experts in that, look at the data, understand it. It's not just the MRI, the MRI data, the picture doesn't just tell us, just like a map doesn't tell us what's going on with a crime problem. The crime analysts, as well as the, the radiologists have to really understand, they have to come up come with experience, but, and know the area, um, and, and know what they're looking at, know the data and interpret those results. Those results then go to the treating doctor because that radiologist doesn't treat the doc, the, the patient, um, works with doctors to treat the patient. That's how we, we support police. We provide that information. Um, they select, hopefully the whole point is to select an evidence-based strategy that's based on those crime analysis results, not just based on um, what they've always done 
and have an evidence-based treatment, evidence-based strategy here. Administering the treatment is not necessarily an easy thing. You can pick the right treatment and not necessarily put it in correctly. Um, I think doctors a lot of times struggle with patients who they either they have surgery, they, they give a medication, they know this medication works, but the patient doesn't take it right? Or they don't take it correctly. They take two pills when they're supposed to take one. They take, they, they don't administer the treatment themselves and the doctor has to work with them. The same thing with strategy implementation. We have to make sure we do it right. But in either case, when it is done right, our patient is cured. So that's a, an important analogy. And, and talking to police about this, um, it's important because you can't, uh, crime analysis doesn't do everything for us. All those things that happen after that are really important to make all this work, to, to how to make it work in an agency. So let's talk a little bit, I think what's important and, and, and we'll move through this and I'll talk about uh, the business model. Uh, for crime analysis and for crime reduction, we have to make sure we distinguish short-term and long-term problems. In policing, police tend to be tactical. They focus on tactical things. They know about the long-term problem. Oh, that's been an area that's been a problem since I started, since I was in the academy, since I first started as an officer. Um, but but when they go to implement things, so say, okay, we're going to go out there and we're going to go and arrest some people right now. Let's, let's go direct to patrol right now. When some problems require long-term strategies, some require short. So we need to distinguish. It's not just having good analysis products, but we even to start off, we have to think about things differently. Um, we also need to create action-oriented products versus just information. I'm missing a little quote there uh, on the end there. But we have to make sure that our products are, are driving action. There are things on there that police can go out and do and not just provide statistics, right? We're not just providing numbers. Um, we have to make sure that what we do also is providing evaluation for an accountability products where we can, where the, the police leaders can actually say whether things are working or not, but then also be able to hold people accountable for that versus just plain old statistics, the percent change up and down, all that kind of stuff, right? And I'm not going to talk about details. This is, again, this is the, the 30,000 foot view. And overall consistency and sustainability by the organization, that's how we make it work. It has to be a system. It has to be a business model. That, they, that the police department does, it has to be a cultural change to be able to do effective crime reduction because just doing a little bit here, a little bit there, uh, you know, uh, hotspots policing here, focus deterrence here, this month, last month, not consistent, not as part of the, what the organization does will not reduce crime. All right, so real quickly, um, what we do in Stratified Police, and we talk about this, I forget what chapter it is, but um, in our book, we talk about how if we're, if we're going to be successful in crime reduction, let's follow something that police already do successfully, and that is answering calls for service. And I don't care where you are in the world, police generally, now maybe a little bit different, but generally in the United States, and even in Europe and different places, we answer the call, we, the citizens call us and we have a system. Um, the police have a system for answering those calls for service. We have technology that supports it. We have policies and procedure that supports it. And pretty much it's it's very, very similar across the world because it works, right? Because that works. So let's do that for crime reduction. And I think that at, at a basic level, and this is how it relates to crime analysis, at a basic level, that business model starts with uh, what calls for service. Well, calls for service, I'm sorry, the calls for service business model starts with the seriousness of the call. So when the citizens call the police and say, um, there's a dog barking next door, there's a party behind my house, or somebody's been killed in front of the house, or there's an active shooter. The responses that police do, who responds, what the responses are required, what the expectations are for those people, who coordinates the response, who's accountable, all of those things depend on the seriousness of the call, right? Barking dog is one officer. A loud party might be two, a domestic might be two, and a, a active shooter is everybody on deck, right? And it's everybody in the police department has expectations for other people based on the call. They understand, you can ask a line level officer who's been on the job for six months, for this particular call, what's the sergeant supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? What's the captain supposed to do? Sometimes there's it's nothing, sometimes it's a lot. But they understand because that is the business model of policing. When we do crime reduction, that's the same, not the same thing. Crime reduction is 
when you have a, a high, you go to a, an officer, you ask them, hey, what are we supposed, what's the sergeant supposed to do for hotspots policing? I don't know. What's the captain do? I don't know. They just tell us to go and, and patrol around. So there's no systematic, there's no expectations. We, we don't know, there's no requirements. And what, so what we want to do to be successful for that sustainability, that consistency um, of crime reduction is to, to model that after calls for service because it does work. So just real quickly, and, I, and, and crime analysis, this, and, and basically all this is stratified, right? Stratified meaning different levels of different things. Calls for service is already stratified. So let's take that and let's stratify crime reduction. So this is what we call stratified policing. Um, and this is our business model. Let's take across the bottom here. As you know, we've got, um, whoops, we've got immediate short-term and long-term problems. So as we, we've got individual incidents, we have major incidents, which are mostly what police deal with. And then we have repeat incidents and patterns, which are short-term repeat calls for service at addresses, crime patterns, and then problem offenders, problem locations, and problem areas. And these are long-term things, right? So, so like I said before, we have to distinguish between these types of problems. And if we're gonna be similar to a calls for service model, then we need to dispatch these. It's not good that officers don't go out and identify their own calls. And they maybe do subject stops and vehicle stops, but basically what police do is serve the community and answer their calls. So we need to create a system of dispatch for these problems. It's not fair to ask officers and sergeants, lieutenants to identify their own problems. So they're going to come based on their experience when we know that it should be based on analysis. So we need to proactively identify and dispatch. Guess who does this? The analysts do this. And so two things in terms of being action and evaluation or what I call voice of the chief. So the analyst, just like with calls for service, the chiefs and the, the agency heads set up the rules for what calls they answer, what the expectations are, what all those things are, but we need to dispatch it. Crime analysis, crime analysts produce products and they're the voice of the chief and their products will come out, not from the analyst, but from the agency. And then people will do things, they will react. So um, that's important. So all of these, there's this whole system for that in stratified policing. Also, crime analysts are the truth tellers in terms of the evaluation. It's not good enough for individual captains and commanders and different people to evaluate their own work because you know how that is. Um, they may include things, may, may, not, may not, but as, and you guys know, you are the truth tellers, but in the system, in this business model, everybody has to understand this is what crime analysts do. So they bookend this whole process and you can't do it you cannot do stratified policing without um, uh, crime analysis. So again, I just wanna go quickly and you can read more about this, but stratified policing really says, okay, crime analysts are identifying these different levels of problems and we're gonna assign them based on seriousness, just like we do calls for service. The more serious a call, the higher the level shows up and has is involved and coordinates. Everybody is involved in, in, in doing the evidence-based proactive crime reduction activities, but officers are only assigned the lower level. As we move up, everybody's engaged. Um, accountability just follows what the police already do. And then we have meetings and these are not CompStat meetings. These are meetings that are crime reduction, action, um, coordination and evaluation meetings. All right, so in terms of um, the, the bringing this all together and I'll let you read a little bit more about, you know, you can look up, if you look at me, you look up um, our center, you'll find a lot more about stratified policing and the things that we've done. But I think it's important my whole point here is crime analysis is necessary. It's not a luxury in crime reduction. We have to have it um, to focus our efforts, but also in this model that that we came, that Roberto and I came up with, it is fundamental, right? It's fundamental. You have to have it, and you can see why. Um, the analysts, again, will never be replaced by technology. And I just going back to the analogy, like I said, I could talk about that for two hours. Just like radiologists will never be replaced by the MRI machine, we always need a person with skills and knowledge and experience to interpret what those things are and know what the purpose of this whole process is. And so technology is not going to do that. Um, technology helps. You can't, you know, MRI is one of the best things that we can do we can use it for data. And the last thing here is really goes back to the association, whether it's IACA or the EACA, is that the role, the role of the crime analysis profession is to support and prove how crime analysts are going to serve that crime reduction. And that is making better products, more action-oriented, focusing what we do, making sure this evaluation-oriented. There, you can produce some of the products that we recommend in stratified policing, and people 
if you don't have the whole business model, it's not going to reduce crime, but those products are still going to be action oriented and can get the agency moving in the right direction. All right, just to finish up, and I think, Sam, I think I almost went exactly the time. Oh, my goodness. I told you I could... I could talk for two hours. I could talk for five minutes. Well, five minutes is a lot harder, but um, here's my information. If you're interested, in, obviously the, the website talks a lot more about stratified policing and about that. It has all the articles that we've written, the research, what we've done um, a little bit more about that. And here's the cover of the book for stratified policing, crime analysis, with crime mapping. Really, you just look up uh, our names and you'll find that online um, and they're available. So with that, I don't know if we have time for questions, probably not. We'll save those for the end, but I'll turn that, I'll stop sharing. If you guys wanna take a screenshot, I'll leave it up for two more seconds. All right, and I will stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. This was really a great presentation. Um, and I hope uh, Matt Plant will not uh, mind if we steal him uh, two or three minutes or we just move it. Um, you go, you go for it. I'm not going to get in Professor Santos's way. You, you carry on. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, yeah, there are two things. One, uh, I would love to invite you now for giving our students and everyone who wants to join us uh, a, a special presentation, like a Meet the Experts session in the next couple of weeks, if you agree, uh, talking a little bit deeper about that stuff, because as you have seen, 30 minutes are very, very short to talk about that. And uh, there are a lot of things where we should ask questions, starting from how to convince the bosses uh, uh, that they understand that there is a, a great value on that work and they should be more proactive. But there is one question I would like to ask you now. Uh, it, it's coming from Beatrice Uzai. Uh, she'd like she would like to ask you how to integrate bias awareness into these approaches to avoid mistakes in the interpretation and understanding of information for an effective analysis. So, so how to avoid, I, I missed the first part there, how to avoid. Um, uh, how do you integrate bias awareness into these approaches to avoid mistakes in the interpretation and understanding of information for an effective analysis? I. I that's a very good question. And I think, you know, it depends, right? <laughs> it's not a simple answer, but let me just give you a quick example about crime. Crime analyst isn't just about understanding the data um, and just and just analyzing the data. It's the a lot of times the analysis products start before you even look at the data. So what data are you going to look at? So say, for example, you're looking for high uh, chronic offenders. One of the things in the United States that we're seeing, and I'm sure it's it's around the world, it's not just here, is that we have to be careful of not of those of, of who we address is in bias, right? So the, a lot of the argument is, well, the police go to certain areas, they contact people, and then th those contacts are used to identify who are high crime people are, or, or chronic offenders are. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So basically the police are out to get people. And so then they get, when they do that, then, then they come up with people that they can go out and get, right? So as a crime analyst, what's important looking at the data is to do that list. A couple of things. We don't want to include, include drug crime because drug crime is a lot of times that's proact what police uh, proactively identify. We don't want to, um, and, and what we want to do is focus on crimes where the citizens are calling the police. So when you say as an an, what you, the products you're pr producing, the analyst can say, uh, and the police can say, hey, no, citizens of this area have called us, have reported these crimes. We have made arrests of different people who've committed these crimes. Now we're looking at those people who are chronically victimizing, because in our high crime areas, I don't care where you are in the world, high crime areas, most of the people are victims. Right, because we know it's very small. So, as an analyst, then if we focus on the certain type of data very purposely, then it gives the the uh, the police a an unbiased way of talking about it. Right, and that's just one small example. So, it's more than just looking at bias in the data, uh, in the numbers, and all that. We have to think about where it comes from. We have to think about what we're using and what the overall purpose uh, is in consideration with those biases. So, I think maybe that's. You know, we can talk more about that, but I think that's a really good example. Thank you so much. Uh, and just at the very end, uh, 
I don't know if you can see this. No, no, it's not. Uh, it's just, can you see it? Because I cannot see it on the screen. Uh, the book. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> You know, yes, I have the, I have the, yeah, I know. Well, that's because you contributed a lot to it, Sam. Yeah. Um, thank you again. Uh, thank you for your time. Hope you can stay a little bit on the, uh, on this meeting to, to yeah. see and hear also the other presenters. And uh, one question was coming up, uh, but I, I will, I, I will uh, save this question for later. I will send it uh, to you. Uh, maybe you you like to answer that. Uh, let's say in the next couple of days, because sure. we would we would lose too much time now if we don't uh, move over to the next one. Uh, thank you again. Uh, and yeah, may I introduce you, uh, Dr. Matthew Bland, from Cambridge University. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Sam. Uh, uh, Matt, it's working. great to. Great to have you on board. Uh, I saw a, a video where you, you were talking about domestic abuse and and police algorithms. So the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you again. <clears throat> and um, let's go. Brilliant. Okay. Um, I'll try and catch you up on time. Um, but I have to say to the audience, um, uh, there's no way I can do this topic justice in, in uh, 25 minutes or 30 minutes. And same as Professor Santos said, I could talk about it all day um, and would be happy to do so an, uh, another another time. Um, it's a, a real privilege to be able to, to speak to you this afternoon and um, on one of my um, uh, most interesting topics of research at the moment, uh, uh, domestic abuse and artificial intelligence. This is going to actually um, pick up on some really uh, interesting points that Professor Santos made about technology and uh, the question about bias will be relevant to this. And I want to, as I'll explain to you in a minute, um, crime, an crime analysis is a big part of my life um, as a profession. And um, I want to sort of center this issue, although it's much broader than just crime analysis, I want to center it on uh, the role that, that analysts can play. Um, the, the sort of hook that I want to sort of pitch to you in this session and, and try to explain it, and of course this is an inference, um, so it's a, a sweeping generalization and, and slightly curtailed here just to sort of hook you in. 1% uh, of all offenders that go through custody suites go on to commit a serious domestic abuse offence. Now when I say domestic abuse, I talk in the English and Welsh terms, so family abuse, intimate partner uh, abuse, but it can be violence, it can be uh, damage to a property, it can be coercive and controlling behaviour, um, but it's within a relationship or within a family unit above, um, above the age of 16. 1% of all offenders, all offenders, any type of crime, who go through a police custody suite will go on to commit a serious domestic abuse crime within two years of their first arrest. It's a, a low number overall, but it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a quite striking prevalence. Artificial intelligence can get to three quarters of those the first time that they come in. It can it can flag them up. That's the that's the premise that I'm I'm pitching to you here. And there are asterisks and caveats to go around these things, of course. And I'll I'll try to talk through some of those. But that's the that's the flavour of this. Um, because um, it, I'm one of those people now, um, just like Professor Santos, who um, will talk about books, <laughs> your books that I've written in, um, which is a funny place to be in in your career. Um, a book that I, I, I wrote a chapter for a couple of years ago on this topic uh, was very much around this premise of um, algorithms being able to predict domestic abuse. But the question I think we have to ask is whether we, we should let them do it, because there's lots of pitfalls that, that can be associated to uh, this type of exercise. And I'm going to talk through some of those in this session as well. Uh, first, I just want to tell you a little bit about me um, so you know who who I am and, and, and where I'm coming from with these things. Uh, I try to endear myself to my audiences by showing pictures of me with children or puppies and today I've gone for my youngest daughter Sophie. Um, I, I'm, I am a crime analyst, I still consider myself to be a crime analyst. I, I stumbled into the profession in 2003 very much by accident when you see a vacancy and you think that, that job looks interesting and I've never left. Um, it's a, a fantastically fulfilling career and although 
I'm no work no longer working inside a law enforcement um, agency. My my daily work is is still with law enforcement agencies um, from an academic perspective every day. Uh, so I'm I'm very fortunate to have um, studied uh, at, at um, Cambridge University under Professor Lawrence Sherman, uh, Professor Barack Ariel, and many others, and um, and and even more fortunate to be the deputy director on the police executive program at that university now. I, I move in lots of police circles. Evidence-based policing is is big, uh, you know, really big on the agenda at Cambridge, um, and, and it's really really helpful actually that Professor Santos has introduced lots of those concepts in the first presentation. Um, I, I also sort of have my fingers in lots of other pies, trying to sort of move crime analysis to the front um, of, of lots of different agendas. So I'm the chair for uh, reformulating police funding in the UK. Uh, in terms of independent technical advice. I manage a number of projects. One of those is around um, using polygraph tests for serious domestic abuse offenders being managed in the community. And I've written books in the last couple of years on domestic abuse, uh, experimental research designs and crime analysis. And for my sins, I support Arsenal Football Club, although this season that's working out quite well. Um, I, what I'm gonna do, diving into the material, um, is first of all just tell you what I mean by artificial intelligence um, and, and this is this touches really nicely on the point in the previous session around technology and, and people and, and particularly crime analysts and how they interact with technology. It's impossible to be a crime analyst and not have to use and engage with technology, it's a, it's a key part of the, of the role and of course as technology evolves you've got to keep your skills up to, up to scratch. Artificial intelligence is, it means different things to different people. And when I talk about it in this sense, I'm really talking about machine learning. Uh, now this diagram, which I borrow with pride from a source I found online, it's, it's quite a neat uh, visualization of the definitions. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and it can often be seen as a threat to people's jobs. And in many cases, rightly so. I don't think that's going to be the case for, uh, uh, for analysts, certainly not in, in our lifetime, because the type of technology that we're talking about here, while very clever, um, is essentially going to need a human to supervise it all of the time, um, both for um, legitimacy reasons, and I'll talk a bit about that in a, a little while, um, but also because the technology is not quite there, particularly around the data quality, and data quality is an issue that I know will be close to all of your hearts um, as, a, as a problem that we have to encounter every day. Um, so when I talk about AI in this presentation, um, th this is what I'm talking about. And I'm really talking about machine learning routines and you know, a processing of big data sets in ways that you know, humans couldn't cope with. And you certainly couldn't manage in something like Microsoft Excel. Now, uh, there are lots of different things that artificial intelligence might be able to do uh, for, for policing. Uh, but I want to talk about um, the sort of burgeoning problem in the in the uh, English and Welsh police setting, which I'm pretty sure will be replicated around the world. But what England and Wales has done is got its national data set for domestic abuse in quite good order in the last decade. So we're able to look at scary graphs like this one. The, the, the number of cases that are reported to the police and the blue line in that graph has been increasing year on year on year, right, right through the pandemic um, and even before the pandemic, it's, it's uh, it more than doubled since uh, 2014 when they made some national changes to recording practices. And that's, that's ostensibly seen as a good thing because lots of this type of crime is, is unseen. It's not, not recorded by police. So getting it on the books and being able to uh, start an investigation, start a course of preventative measures, spot the patterns, uh, that's all really important. But in the red line and the green line, you can see that there hasn't been commensurate changes in the number of those cases that get passed to the CPS, which is the Crown Prosecution Service in England and Wales, so the, uh, the barristers who will be prosecuting the cases. And then the number of prosecutions in the green line, the, court, the cases that actually go to court and end up in a conviction, they are lagging way, 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 way behind uh, the number of cases that are being recorded and this is a you know, this is a, a a big symptom of what i think is really an, a national emergency around this type of crime 
uh, where victims really aren't getting any kind of justice uh, at the moment. Now, um, I'm going to paraphrase lots of research for domestic abuse. One of the, but one of the key things to draw your attention to this afternoon is uh, the, this phenomenon of, of concentration of harm. So while I've shown you there are lots of domestic abuse cases, if we apply a severity measurement tool, such as the Cambridge Crime Harm Index, no surprise that that's my go-to, what we see is actually it's a very small proportion, this red triangle at the top of this funny shape here, that actually accounts for most of the severity. So this is about 2% of known domestic abuse cases, uh, representing 80% of harm. So this goes beyond that Pareto principle of 80-20. This is even more extreme than that. So what we're saying here is actually the, the real risk of harm uh, is in quite a small segment of the population that we need to deal with. So uh, trying to get ahead of the game and identify those uh, that small number of cases is, is a key, key part of, of the response that we need to put in place. But we have more problems. Um, and I call this one the prediction problem. Uh, and this, is, this relates to trying to get into that red triangle before it becomes the red triangle. Um, we want to, to stop people before they get to uh, the, the serious level of offending that we see. Now, I want you to um, just for a moment, imagine that this 100 people, uh, 100 people that I've put on the screen here represent what I would call the power few. So these are the most harmful cases in any year. Now, this is obviously a made up number, so 100 is just a representative. Um, what we would say the year after, typically, is that only two of them will be in the most harmful group for year two, for that year. And the, 90, and the other 98 will be a completely different set of people. So just targeting that 100 people for this type of crime in the first year and carrying on is not gonna solve a great deal of problems in year two, or indeed in year three, when you've got another two, but it's a different two. Uh, so when you take your most harmful group in the first year, most of them aren't most harmful again in the second year. And again, in the third year, most of them are not harmful, but those that are are switching around. So what we're finding here is there's a moving target and it carries on into year three. There's another two. So from our original hundred, we've got six people who continually being harmful domestic abuse but they, they are randomly jumping in and out of this group. So we need, to, we need to think smart about how we can identify, one, the people who are going to be consistently coming back, but two, what about these other 98% who are seemingly coming, coming from somewhere else? This is, this is a, a, um, an excuse to use clip art because why do you need one? Um, the, we're essentially chasing a moving target. And I think this is um, this is a particular problem in England and Wales at the moment because a lot of investment has gone into perpetrator intervention programs. It, there's been as a national awareness that not a lot have been being done for perpetrators of domestic abuse to manage them uh, through their, their sort of life course of their their offending patterns. Uh, a lot of money gets thrown at that, and a lot of initiatives spring up as a result. But what this is what this data is is showing us is that actually the people who are being targeted may naturally desist um, of their own accord and, and the interventions therefore aren't needed. But a smaller proportion of people um, who are actually becoming harmful are, are often coming from a, a different background. And what we see when we look at that, it gets even worse. So if I go back to my original 100 from the first year who represent my, my power few group, 41 of those, which is another way, crude way of saying 41%, have never been heard of before for domestic abuse. They have come completely out of the blue. Now, logically, um, if you think about the, the theories that underpin intimate partner violence and domestic abuse, that probably isn't a surprise because this is, a, this is known as a hidden crime. It often incubates in relationships, in households, before it becomes to comes to law enforcement attention. And then when it does finally manifest uh, on police records, you have got to a, a serious case when actually there's been instances of violence before that. So where does that leave us in terms of AI? Um, well, the, the very glib, um, truncated answer to that is, 
AI can help us identify uh, not only these in red, but these in gray here as well before they become serious. And that is a bit of an industry, um, particularly in the UK at the moment around risk assessing domestic abuse cases and trying to triage those which require uh, the, the premium interventions. The process that we have in place, there are several articles that have been published tell us that, that those tools that we use, and you may have heard of some of them, domestic abuse, stalking and harassment tools, they have them in Canada, they will have them in different parts of Europe as well. They do not have high predictive validity for actually identifying high harm cases, particularly um, before, they, before they occur. They, they're often quite reactive to cases after a serious crime has occurred. And this is where AI can, can practically um, uh, help us in theory. So this is the model I want to sort of put across to you. Um, and this is where I sort of started in terms of artificial intelligence being able to predict most serious offenders. It would work something a little bit like this. The suspect comes into custody, booked in by a sergeant or a custody officer who would enter details into uh, an app which connects to an artificial intelligence routine. Now that artificial intelligence routine would look at all previous history collected known to that offender. So obviously there are some uh, prerequisites here about the standard of data and whether you can link it to a particular individual. The artificial intelligence routine, providing the data are there to, to work with, will then calculate the probability of a future offence. Now you can set your window for that future offence. Artificial intelligence is a, a very flexible, um, uh, it can be completely flexible depending on what the, the analysts or the designers uh, wish. What's actually happening in here is that each offender's data is, is going through hundreds of decision trees um, that have been trained uh, off-site before this becomes live to uh, optimize the accuracy of uh, predictions. So it's looking at cases that did end up to be serious and cases that didn't end up to be serious. And it's identifying patterns in often completely unre unrelated indicators, such as age of first offense, the type of crime when people were offended, the time since they last offended, things that have no, not necessarily any theoretical link to whether there is domestic abuse offending. And the resulting forecast from, from AI uh, will, will be often, it's a, it's a, a series of decisions and the, the, it will run the forecast hundreds and hundreds of times. And the winning, the winning forecast is the one that comes up the most. So um, this is, this is a, a technique, a, you know, an analytical technique that humans can conceive of, but actually practically are not gonna have the time to, to be able to, to run through, let alone the, the processing power. What we see, and uh, we have got research that's run this sort of um, routine uh, in the background. So nothing live here, but looking at historic data and assessing actually which pathway would these, would these go down. So this is looking at uh, all suspects who have been brought into custody, gone through this process, and then, recommend, and then recommending a prediction uh, of whether they will go on to commit no domestic abuse within two years, less a less serious domestic abuse crime within two years or a more serious crime within two years. And what we find here is that they, they break down accordingly. So very few forecasts are um, for serious abuse. And most of those forecasts end up being wrong. 90% of them are wrong, 10% of them are right. That sounds a bit strange. You think, well, actually, you're telling me this is often more often wrong than it is. It's right. And that's that's correct, because the artificial intelligence has been skewed that way to be risk averse. What actually happens in this 10 percent of correct predictions is that it's scooping up three quarters of the actual serious domestic abuse cases. So. D serious domestic abuse cases, and obviously I, I'm not going to go into the definition of what constitutes more serious here. Serious domestic abuse cases are, as we showed earlier, few and far between in the grand scheme of, of all domestic abuse. And predicting them is a, is, is a difficult game. So by upping the number of predictions that we make, which, which brings in lots of false positives, we can get to, to more of those cases. 
but still with the majority of forecasts being uh, for no further abuse happening. And indeed, when we when the our AI forecasts that, no further abuse does happen, which is what you would hope for. And this is obviously just one example and being raced through in a 30 minute session uh, with lots more detail underpinning. But it's illustrative, I hope, of the art of the possible for, for this type of technique. I think most people would agree if you could come up with a system that worked like this manually, it would be it would be hugely advantageous, particularly to tactical planning. Of course, um, it would be it would be negligent of me to try to sell this or try to pitch this as an easy uh, development um, for crime analysis for evidence based policing. It by but is by no means a, a done deal, um, and nor should it be. Um, just to briefly cover the what I think are the, the possibly the top three potential pitfalls to this type of procedure. First and foremost, um, any society that working with policing by consent, you know, the public need to buy into policing. Uh, this is a threat to the legitimacy of the policing service. We have to consider both for victims and perpetrators, uh, what's the proportionality, you know, what's the justification for using uh, a machine, to effectively using advanced mathematics to decide which pathway somebody goes down. And then that's, that's really important point, not just for this type of AI and policing, but for any type of AI and policing. And you'll see lots of coverage about sort of burgeoning AI projects uh, like PredPol, where this, this type of issue comes up and, and we really need to attend to that. You've got potential issues of efficiency. Um, so I talked there about um, the majority of forecasts for serious domestic abuse cases actually don't end up with, with serious domestic abuse. So there's an argument there that there is wasted resource. You are, you are putting in interventions when you, you need not. And obviously the trade-off there is actually you're getting to most of the cases where there was serious abuse. But there is a question there of what is most efficient. And then of course there is risk that is attached to this. 99% of the time when an AI, when the AI in this example forecasts no abuse, there was no abuse, but 1% of the time there was. And th there you're back to a legitimacy question where you have uh, a, a machine uh, deciding on a, a pathway and actually being wrong. And at the end of that, there is a victim uh, who, who has come to harm because of that process. The flip side is whether uh, the humans are currently doing any better. That's a whole different issue for a different day. There are a few frameworks that we can talk about. And I'm going to briefly uh, go through these, Sam, so I can get you back on time. We need frameworks. Um, we need regulation of this type of technology. Um, nobody's going to want to do it uh, because it's arduous. But we have got some emerging frameworks like this one, which is called AlgoCare, developed by a professor called Marion Oswald uh, from Sheffield uh, Hallam University. Um, this is being used in the UK now um, by police chiefs to uh, tentatively vet their applications of artificial intelligence. And um, I think it's a good development, um, but I think there's more that, that can go on in, in this space. Um, certainly it's a step towards justification and responsible use of technology and a move away from the sort of current Wild West environment that we're, we have been in. What we have to do, and this uh, again comes back to Professor Santos's point about um, chief officers being at the top of, of this, uh, this program, the executives have to be engaged. It, AI is shiny, it sounds great, um, uh, it, it's going to look good for politicians involved in policing who want to get elected, um, but they need to know what they're dealing with because this, is, um, this has got lots of risks associated to it, and to, to jump in uh, and be irresponsible with this type of technology could result in, in serious harm uh, coming about. And similarly, um, good AI uh, that has early teething problems, as it inevitably will, might be thrown out um, by executives who are not prepared to, to take the risks. So 
engaging executives is incredibly important. You guys, uh, analysts are essential, essential to the development of, of these type of practices. Uh, and I think this is one of the new frontiers in, in skills development for analysts. And I don't mean in coding, um, although of course, you know, that has a, a time and a place, but being able to understand how artificial intelligence works, what the operation of things like forecasting models are, how, how you assess the accuracy of those models. Th these are gonna be essential skill sets for, for analysts to be able to engage with, advise on, um, and, and even help put into place these, these types of, of technology. Inevitably, your organizations are gonna be faced with lots of consultancies who claim to be selling the next biggest thing. And it's important to be able to understand what's going on behind the scenes there and evaluate whether whether those actually doing what they they should be doing and um i think you know where to go i sort of finish off this this presentation by just sort of saying you know thoughts about where we go next it's a big bright bold future uh, for um for artificial intelligence in policing uh, i think it's going to mean lots of lots of exciting things for for crime analysts and we've got the normal um, gambit of things that we need to face. We're going to need to train people uh, across agencies, not just crime analysts. We're going to need to test rigorously um, the, the AI routines uh, once we've decided we what we want to use them for. And we need to experiment. We need, to, we need research evidence in this area to generate that library of what works, again, that, um, that Professor Santos talked about earlier on. That's the end of my talk. Of course, I can't leave it without getting um, some uh, unashamed promotion in for my books. Um, my, my book on crime analysis is nowhere near as good as Professor Santos's, which is also on my bookshelf, um, but I commend it to you nonetheless. Um, please feel free to follow up with me um, either by email or Twitter um, and happy Sam to participate in any follow-up sessions that you organize. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, uh, just uh, coming to the point about your books, and it, this also goes to Rachel. We do have more than enough space. If you want to promote your stuff on the website, just uh, send me some stuff, and I will I will publish it, uh, of course, uh, as as a, a as a guest of of thank you for you guys, uh, um, and I, I will leave it up to all of our, our members and visitors to to see the information about your books so yeah. they can- they won't can, say no, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, that, that would be great. Uh, anyway, uh, there were, were some questions coming in, but if you agree, I will, I will send them to you uh, for answering it. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, there is one guy who, uh, is thinking about uh, can we rely to uh, AI uh, with all these data and that stuff? And I think that it, it, it there is a need to answer uh, it a little bit more detail. And uh, there is also a good friend of mine. I saw his his question. He is offering his uh, experience in using um, uh, software. Uh, we they supported with this software. Uh, the fight against residential burglary it's also a, a kind of ai uh, and he he will reach out to you to talk a little bit more and and, and uh, maybe you you are interested in his experience so i bring you guys together terrific thank you a anyway uh it's the same to you uh we should have a, a special session in the near future and especially because so many people are a little bit afraid about AI, I think uh, we could do a live event in the next couple of months anywhere, uh, maybe in Malta where EFI is based and, and can invite people to have their uh, a, a huge discussion about that stuff. Maybe uh, we can also invite other experts. And I think this is a really, really good topic uh, where we also need to have a live event and not only uh, talking about that online. If you agree, uh, um, Andreas and I will work on that. Uh, it sounds like, in my opinion, it sounds like a, a, a really great idea. Thank you That's again. Terrific. terrific. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you again, Matt. Uh, uh, I hope you stay with us a little bit. 
And now it's a special honor for me to introduce you to Dr. Joe Kaplan from Rutgers University. I had the luck uh, that he taught me uh, one of the first uh, sessions I ever uh, uh, joined uh, when, I, when I jumped into ICA. It's around uh, 11 or 12 years ago. And I, I, I was uh, so excited about that stuff that I, I cannot uh, explain it uh, in a way like it was uh, impacting me in, in, uh, in the way I was thinking about what we can do. Uh, the risk terrain modeling was at this time a complete different way uh, to think about what you can do uh, to prevent crime. Uh, it was not only the using historic data to uh, have a look in the crystal ball for the future, it was a complete uh, different approach and uh, I, I really uh, appreciate that I could get Joel uh, on board for giving us a speech about this and what happened in the last 11 years in this field. I think there are a lot of things uh, were showing up uh, and thank you again, Joel, for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be in such great company on this panel. And uh, believe it or not, this fall, risk train modeling turns 14 years old. So it's it's been a long time. We've done a lot over the past decade uh, plus. Um, forgive me, I'm a bit under the weather today, but it is a virtual conference, so I refuse to call out sick. Um, but I will uh, go ahead and share my screen and begin. All right, hopefully you can see. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to talk to you about risk train modeling, but specifically about how it's being used uh, uh, now for crime prevention and public safety. First, um, it's it's interesting that uh, you know many of our previous uh, panelists talked you know connected crime analysis and our profession to you know the medical field and, and public health. And interestingly enough, I have a similar slide. Um, you know, imagine if you have a headache for several days in a row and you go to your doctor because you want your headache to stop and your doctor says, well, I think because you've had a headache for the past three days, you're probably going to have one tomorrow. Nice seeing you so long. You know, if, if that was all we got from our doctor, that is a basically a prediction about what's likely to happen tomorrow because we've had a headache for the past three days um, already, uh, we probably wouldn't be satisfied. Instead, we want our doctor to diagnose the headache so that uh, he or she can prescribe solutions and prescribe a response. Um, but we want our doctor to diagnose the problem and ultimately help us solve it. And crime hotspots are similar. That is crime, crime hotspots, the persistence of crime in certain places. These are signs and symptoms of environments that are highly suitable for crime. What we need to do is we need to diagnose crime hotspots. We need to come up with solutions to prevent hotspots and prevent the uh, persistence of problems at certain places over time. That is, by diagnosing hotspots, we can understand what can be contributing to them and come up with solutions and prescriptions for prevention. This can apply to a variety of different fields or crime problems from gun violence to uh, knife crimes to motor vehicle thefts or even package thefts uh, in the U.S. Amazon, uh, Amazon package thefts or porch piracy are big problems. And even these um, can be addressed as uh, by understanding the spatial uh, components and considerations for what is contributing to these uh, to, to these problems in certain places at certain times. And so by when we diagnose crime patterns, we are using risk terrain modeling, RTM, uh, to connect environmental features to crime locations to help us come up with the best strategies for prevention and service. So as an introduction to risk terrain modeling, uh, as an approach to diagnosing crime patterns, I'm going to go through a quick scenario or example. Many of us as analysts uh, and as uh, you know, uh, professionals in the field of crime analysis and policing, we have tons of data, terabytes of data are created on a daily basis. So imagine that you have some of that data and you have it in tabular form. Uh, you might have addresses of violent crimes or addresses of property crimes or drug overdoses. We take that raw data and we often map it. And when we do that, we call it crime mapping. And crime mapping is incredibly valuable. It tells us um, 
how the data that we see on the table, how it distributes throughout the geography, where it's located. Maybe it appears uniformly distributed. Maybe it appears to be clustering and forming hotspots. Maybe it appears to be random. But crime mapping shows where the problem is, but it doesn't necessarily tell us why it's happening at these places or what's common, what's, what the common denominator is across these places. When we add risk train modeling to the analysis, we begin to realize uh, certain, certain things about these places. For example, that all of these incidents are occurring within close proximity to vacant properties or gas stations or convenience stores or pawn shops or liquor stores or bars or fast food restaurants. That is, the, these places are contributing to opportunities and contexts for crime. The settings that are the interaction or co-location of these particular features are what we define as risky places when we diagnose these crime patterns with risk terrain modeling. And when we identify the risky places, we can also identify other places that have similar qualities that are also vulnerable to crime because the settings or contexts located there are similar to the patterns that we've been experiencing elsewhere. So risk train modeling offers an enhanced spatial analysis that helps us diagnose not just where the crime incidents are occurring, but also why they might be occurring in these places. That is how they connect with the environments that are unique to the locations where, they're, where we are experiencing these problems. And so risk terrain modeling is an analytic technique that diagnoses crime patterns and helps us deploy resources to priority places. In fact, it helps us um, optimize resources by selecting priority places based upon crime patterns in the moment, in the here and now. Um, for example, the past month or the past three months, we don't need hot spots to occur. We might have five or six incidents that might appear random, but could have a common denominator that could be diagnosed through RTM. For example, carjackings might appear random, the six incidents that have occurred, but they all occur at a gas station next to a bus stop near a highway on-ramp. Risk tray modeling also helps us know where to go and how to deploy resources by giving them instructions on what to focus on when they get there. So risk train modeling is about focusing on places, not just the people that are located there at any given moment in time. <clears throat> RTM is based on research. And many of the previous pre uh, earlier presenters have talked about the role of research and, and translating research to practice. And so I just wanna highlight the, uh, the connection that risk tray modeling has to existing research. There's over 65 peer reviewed journal publications from around the world by independent researchers demonstrating the, the uh, validity and reliability of risk tray modeling as an analytic technique for diagnosing crime patterns. There's also a growing body of research demonstrating the effect, the crime reduction benefits for applying risk train modeling within policing or uh, when applied by other uh, community partners as I'm going to introduce to you today. But RTM began around 2000, uh, in 2008. One of our first presentations was in 2009. Um, we then got a, uh, a grant from the National Institute of Justice, the Department of Justice in the United States to conduct uh, six experiments simultaneously across the US. That then led to a series of studies that led to a series of publications and a growing body of research began to emerge, testing the impact of risk train modeling on crime reduction. Um, on average, we found that crime reduction uh, achieved at least a 30% um, uh, reduction on average across many of the cities in which risk train modeling was tested. Um, Although that study focused primarily on the application of RTM within policing and was known as a risk-based policing initiative. The growing um, application of risk train modeling led that was often done by hand, uh, as, as Sam had mentioned, when we first met, 
risk chain modeling was something that we did by hand. We used a lot of different tools and resources, whether it was QGIS or ArcGIS or MapInfo, as well as other statistical packages. And we kind of bounced around between all of them to do what needed to be done to go through the steps of risk train modeling. Um, and a, a grant from the National Institute of Justice in 2016 allowed us to develop a software application that automated those steps. This made risk train modeling much more accessible for a variety of different stakeholders. Um, and even those that didn't have a, a particular skill set in GIS or statistics could then still do risk train modeling by using the software that was available. Most recently, we received a, a grant from the a Bureau of Justice Assist Assistance to demonstrate the role that risk train modeling can have in crime prevention when taken out of a police agency, but instead uh, applied at a citywide level among multiple stakeholders where policing is one of the spokes in the wheel, but not necessarily the hub of the crime analysis uh, apparatus. And I'm going to uh, introduce you to that as well. Um, I've got QR codes throughout this presentation, uh, so I encourage you to scan the QR codes to bring you to the websites for easy access to some of the things that I'm referencing. And if you have any questions about any of it, I'm happy to follow up with those links as well if you don't have time to scan them. But the RTM software um, allows us to run an analysis for any type of incident or crime problem that we're interested in analyzing. For example, uh, here's an analysis, a report from an analysis for shootings in 2018 in Philadelphia, in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, in the U.S. What this tells us is that if we're within a thousand feet of convenience stores, we're at 4.8 or almost five times more likely to experience shootings than elsewhere in the city. If we are in an area that has a high concentration of pawn shops or jewelry stores, we are at 1.7 are almost two times more likely to experience shootings than elsewhere in the city. In places throughout the city of Philadelphia, which is you know many, many square miles, a large area, at the micro level, at the hyper-local level, we know that if we're in a location that is in close proximity to convenience stores with ATM machines next to beauty salons near pawn shops, we, are, we have an aggravated risk of shootings compared to elsewhere in the city. And the combination of these factors create what we call risk terrain maps, which allow us to visually see where the vulnerable locations are and to then begin to prioritize our resources. But once we run the analysis, we get tables, we get risk factors, we get maps that show us the high, high and lower risk places within a city. And I should mention that it also uh, identifies or allows for kind of an equitable distribution of resources because we can identify high risk locations in low crime neighborhoods and we can identify low risk places in high crime neighborhoods and so we can um, we it allows for identification of vulnerable locations in a way that allows for an equitable distribution of resources by considering relative risks in the areas that we're focused on. But once we take those analyses, uh, or once we get those analyses, we bring it to the next step, which is to form risk narratives. Risk narratives allow us to make connections between how the features that are identified through the RTM analysis connect with lived experiences and observations from the field. For example, in one analysis for robberies, we identified three risk factors that were connected with the settings in which these robberies tended to occur the most often vacant lots, gas stations, and convenience stores. Um, these results were, were uh, presented by the analyst to uh, police officers and commanders during their next uh, commander's meeting. And they the, uh, the analyst was able to kind of uh, catalyze a conversation or encourage a conversation around why these places likely connected with robberies based upon local experience. What they learned was everybody had ideas. And so these are essentially ideas that are or, um, a contribution of hypotheses that are informed by the results of the data and analytics. For example, ideas for vacant lots included, these might be uh, where there's opportunities for loitering. And then somebody else added to that and said, well, if people are loitering, maybe they're surveilling nearby places for potential targets of victimization. Somebody else said, maybe these are these vacant lots are being used as stash houses for stolen items 
before they get fenced. But after the person gets robbed, these vacant lots are simply the stash houses for those pro the, the uh, items that are being uh, taken. <clears throat> the gas stations, the analysts realized that based upon incident reports, attendants have reported being robbed of cash, especially during late night hours. But we, they also realized that people who are filling up their vehicles go into the gas stations to pay or to buy cigarettes or to get some other you know, sodas or something else. Um, they're having their cell phones stolen while walking out of the uh, gas station kiosk uh, and returning to their car, which makes sense because you know this is maybe the first time that they're checking their phones. Hopefully, they're not texting while driving, or maybe they're putting their wallets, the money back in their wallets. That is, they're distracted. They're not paying attention to their surroundings. They're being caught off guard. Their cell phones are being stolen. And if their cell phones are being stolen as a product of the robbery, in one jurisdiction, it was mostly iPhones, and they called it apple picking. Um, then they realize that maybe the convenience stores are coming up as significant because these convenience stores have these kiosks. I don't know if they have them uh, in, in some of the, the uh, uh, cities and jurisdictions in Europe, but they're very commonplace in the U.S. where these recycle ATM machines allow you to dispose of your used uh, cell phones and tablet devices for instant cash. It's kind of a, a trade for your old devices for cash. And so a lot of these convenience stores have these recycle ATM machines, which um, uh, under normal circumstances, uh, if you own it, you can get cash. But if your phone is, is stolen during a robbery, um, these might be places where those devices are being fenced. And so the connection between the three features of the environment that were identified through the RTM analysis began to form a risk narrative um, uh, where Convene, where vacant lots are likely places where people loiter to surveil for nearby uh, nearby gas stations for targets of victimization. Once those people are victimized, their cell phones are stolen, and then the offenders go to the nearby convenience stores to dispose of the stolen goods at these recycle ATM machines. This risk narrative or hypothesis, if you will, may not be accurate, but it is a likely possibility based upon the data, and it allows for conversations about what can be done to mitigate these risks, to change the opportunities and contexts for this particular robbery problem at and around these places. And so here's an example of what I mean by that. Um, an, analysis, an RTM analysis for shootings was conducted in Atlantic City. The top three risk factors were found to be convenience stores, vacant buildings, and laundromats. These results were presented by the analyst to the commanders uh, in the room, and they were asked to ground truth these results. They said, you know what, this makes sense to us, and here's why. Shootings are often connected with turf conflict. Turf conflict is often connected with the drug trade. What we think is happening is that convenience stores are places that are easy to loiter, easy to come and go. This is where the buyers are solicited for purchase of the drugs. Then they're told to go to the nearby laundromats, which are open late, easy to come and go. Um, or, um, open late, but not surveilled by a human operator. This is where the buyers are told to make the drug transactions off the street and out of sight from passing uh, police or patrol units. Then the buyers go from the laundromats to the nearby vacant buildings to use the drugs, but also the nearby vacant buildings offer opportunities uh, for stash houses of drugs and weapons by the dealers. That is, the places where these three things are located are the best places for drug selling, which increases the likelihood of turf conflict, which results in a disproportionate number of shootings throughout the city in these particular areas. This risk narrative informed a conversation about what could be done to mitigate these risks. Police identified the high-risk locations and focused patrols at and around those areas. They were instructed to do directed patrols, but also business checks at the convenience stores and laundromats. And when they patrolled these areas, they were told to pay attention to these features, but also the vacant buildings. In some cases, they didn't just drive by or sit outside of them, but they got out of their car, walked around to see what was happening at these vacant buildings. Maybe the boards were taken off uh, some of the entrances or windows, and they were able uh, to follow up and make sure that the vacant properties were properly uh, boarded up. Um, 
they did this at peak time periods, but the police and the analysts also presented these results to the other city agencies. Public Works was able to add street lights or do the switch outs from the halogen lights to the LED lights in a more intentional and data informed way. Of the 4,000 street lights in the city, they were able to prioritize those street lights for the switch outs of halogen to LED um, in the areas that were at, at high risk located next to vacant buildings, convenience stores, and laundromats. The planning department, who was already in the process of boarding up vacant lots, was able to reprioritize their the allocation of their resources to board up the vacant lots, the vacant buildings uh, located next to convenience stores and laundromats. And they also had a demolition list. They were able to reprioritize the demolition list to prioritize given limited funding to prioritize the demolition of vacant lots that were vacant buildings that were contributing to the high-risk locations. When police utilize these resources, uh, utilize risk train modeling and existing resources to address the problems that are diagnosed through the RTM analysis, they are able to not only affect crime prevention benefits, but they are able to, to do it in a way that allows for sustainability. Um, Kansas City is one example. You can scan this link and hopefully see the two minute video uh, of how Kansas City and Captain uh, Jonas Boffman, who's a proud member of the IACA uh, in the US, um, many of you might know him, um, he describes it quite well. Um, but what he describes is something that they've done in Kansas City where they've utilized risk terrain modeling to address issues of priority and of priority concern for them. For example, gun violence in Kansas City, they were able to identify high-risk locations, identify prior, priority places, and then come up with uh, form risk narratives informed by those converse, by those analyses. For example, gun violence in Kansas City, um, some of the risk factors included cell phone stores, liquor stores, bus stops, vacant properties, variety stores, or these dollar stores. Um, and they were able to deploy their resources in a way that addressed uh, these issues. For example, Police, generally speaking, identified the priority places and deployed directed patrols um, at key places and times throughout the jurisdiction. When they were focused on these areas, they were given instructions about uh, what to pay attention to when they arrived, including the cell phone stores and the vacant properties and the bus stops and so forth. So they did business checks at these facilities. They also partnered with other city agencies. For example, regulated industries was able to ensure licensing and compliance at the areas of high risk for the features that were contributing to the problems, such as the Metro PCS store or the liquor store that you see in this in this image. The um, Neighborhood Preservation Department is responsible for boarding up and demolition of vacant properties. The police were able to get them to prioritize their efforts at the high risk locations. But KCPD also took the results of the analysis. And this is something that, uh, that Rachel uh, mentioned earlier. You know, the analyst is the catalyst for change in, in, in crime prevention. You need crime analysts, you need the human element. And it's not just about running an analysis with a piece of software, it's about interpreting and communicating these, these results. KCPD took the results of the RTM analysis and used it as a way to engage with other community stakeholders. Their analysts began meeting uh, and, and representatives from the police department began meeting with other directors of other municipal departments to review the crime problems and show the share the results of the RTM analysis. Departments like the planning department or public works or regulated industries who never before thought that they had a role to play in crime prevention, often the burden is, is placed solely on police they were kind of quickly introduced or clearly introduced to the role that they have on sharing the responsibility for crime prevention and public safety programming. And RTM allowed for coordination of those resources. So the data informed discussions from the RTM analysis allowed other city departments to figure out what they were best equipped to do to address specific problems in the city. For example, the transit authority was able to identify problematic bus stops and relocate them in, in ways that didn't disrupt legitimate uses of uh, bus stops by people who needed to catch the bus, but they were able to do a relocate bus stops in a way that changed the interaction effects with other 
features of the environment, in this case, which were creating uh, settings for, uh, for violent crime as connected with loitering in the drug trade uh, within close proximity to liquor stores and vacant properties. Um, this not only reduced loitering, but it also mitigated an open air drug market in the city in this high risk location. Uh, two code violations were also noticed at one of the liquor stores, and the fire marshal was then deployed uh, to enforce those ordinances. The analysts within KCPD were able to use the results from the RTM analysis to encourage other city agencies to play a role in crime prevention. So the intervention activities for the risk-based policing initiative in Kansas City allowed for optimal deployment of resources, such as directed patrols, do things such as uh, tactical community engagement, if you will, such as through business checks. Um, but they were also able to coordinate and deploy resources that included non-police personnel and non-police resources. And they were able to, uh, to have positive police community interactions in high-risk locations by um, empowering officers to focus on these areas, get out, and engage with the public without assuming that everybody located there was a potential suspect, but rather the focus was taken off of people and put on places. Here's an, uh, one of the um, articles that was uh, written about that study. What they found was that over an entire year, the approach was not only sustainable, but led to, on average, a 20%, over 20% reduction in violent crimes compared to the control areas. And they were able to achieve this crime prevention without an abundance of law enforcement actions against people that were located in the target areas. Um, so what we've learned from the application of risk trade modeling over the years as the director, the now director of the Office of Integrated Public Safety Solutions and former deputy chief of Dallas Police Department says, we need to differentiate between law enforcement and public safety. We need to think differently about crime prevention. And risk train modeling helps us with just that. Because just like a prism breaks light into its component uh, colors to see a rainbow, risk train modeling takes a problem analyzes it, diagnoses that problem, and breaks it up into its component parts so that we can come up with a multifaceted intervention strategy for crime prevention and public safety programming. As the father of problem-oriented policing said during his Stockholm Prize in Criminology in 2018, Herman Goldstein says, we need to deeply understand each problem and think creatively about the best possible tailor-made responses. Uh, we also need the right tools and technologies to allow us to do that but also we need to realize that the role of the analyst in interpreting these results and communicating them with the right stakeholders at the right times is equally important. When we have the right tools and resources to analyze our problems, we can get the right resources to the right places at the right times. This reduces demand among multiple agencies, allows each agency to better focus on its priorities and its strengths, and it ultimately results in better outcomes. The Newark Public Safety Collaborative is one example of this, where they take the results of the RTM analysis, they take it out of the police department, share it with multiple stakeholders. All of them become informed by the same data and analytics. They add context and form risk narratives. The police are part of that process, but they are not the uh, they are not spearheading the initiative, which allows for a crime prevention program that where law enforcement is one part of the effort, but not the primary response. As one final example of this approach, an analysis was conducted where aggravated assaults were identified as a priority issue. RTM was used to analyze aggravated assaults in Newark. On the left, we see the risk terrain maps, a top 5% of highest risk places in the South Ward of Newark, the top 1% on the bottom map. The place features that were contributing to these risks were shown on the top right. We, um, multiple people were involved in forming a risk narrative around these issues, but the analyst also identified because abandoned buildings and vacant lots were the top risk factors in these areas, they produced a report that included the addresses of these locations in the highest risk areas. 
in the priority places. This report was then shared. So police were able to do directed patrols and focus on the high risk locations and the features within them at those areas, but also the public works and planning department was able to prioritize their resources at the addresses that needed the attention the most. But they also shared these results with other community partners. The nonprofit organization, New Community Corporation, uh, used it as a site suitability analysis. Their, their mission is to remediate abandoned buildings and improve access to affordable housing. They did just that, but they did it by choosing abandoned buildings in the high risk locations so that not only did they improve access to affordable housing and owner occupied housing, but they did it in the areas that were also going to have a positive impact on public safety and crime prevention. The South Ward Children's Alliance partnered with newer community solutions to adopt city owned vacant lots in the high risk locations and turn them into usable spaces for kids to play with stages and library boxes and mural arts programs. The Outreach workers were able to use the results of the analysis to deploy their ambassadors to high-risk locations at and around schools to help ensure safe passage for kids uh, walking to and from school in the morning and afternoon hours. These approaches to crime prevention, whether it's in a police department and uh, referred to as risk-based policing, where it's limited only to policing resources or the police reach out to other city agencies and involve them in the process, or the analysts take that, uh, or the analysts use risk train modeling as an analytic tool outside of a police agency, involve multiple stakeholders, including the police, but it's spearheaded as a city or community initiative. This is referred to as data informed community engagement. And it's one of the many ways in which risk train modeling as an analytic technique is becoming a commonplace approach to crime prevention and public safety programming in many cities around the world. So risk train modeling is an analytic technique. It's used to diagnose crime patterns and help you deliver better spatial awareness, better community engagement, and ultimately safer communities in the jurisdictions that you serve. Thank you again for your time and attention and Sam for inviting me and including me in such um, a momentous occasion, uh, the inaugural event for the new association. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joel. It was really, really great uh, to have you here on board, and 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 like uh, I, I really enjoy your presentation. And like I said it to all the other guys, uh, the panelists uh, they presented before, uh, we should have also a special session only with you, and maybe uh, one or two of you guys. I would love to have them also to on board, like Les and all this and all the others. Uh, let's see if we can find a way to talk a little bit deeper about that. It's also for you that there are some questions coming in, uh, and I will forward it to you. Uh, please uh, take your time uh, to check uh, the, the questions and please answer it. Uh, answer them also to the to the people who ask the questions. That would be great and would be highly appreciated. Uh, Thank you again, Joel. Uh, we'll stay uh, in contact because uh, we are working on the next events, uh, these the special sessions like Meet the Expert and all that stuff in the next couple of weeks. So uh, we will reach out to you and hope we can get you again on board to talk to our members and our students again, especially uh, about risk train modeling. And I, I, I love the, uh, uh, again, I love the approach, how, how, how you deal with that. And I'm a big fan of preventing crime and not uh, administrate it, which uh, reduces, uh, in my opinion, which reduces the, the crime so much and the impact of, uh, of the environment. Really great. Thank you again. Uh, uh, apologize to all our, our people who are uh, in, in our event at the moment that we are a little late, but I hope you, you will enjoy also the, the rest of the speakers. And for now, it's a great honor uh, to introduce you to the next uh, panelist. Uh, I met him just uh, weeks ago, uh, north of London on a conference, and I was more than uh, uh, impressed about his speech about the current challenges and opportunities for crime analysts. 
and also uh, about his uh, view in the future. Uh, and I, I warmly welcome uh, my friend, Mark Parkinson, head of the crime analysis unit uh, with the uh, Metropolitan Police London. Uh, a warm welcome to you, Mark. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's great to have you here and the floor is yours. No, thank you. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to to be here, and uh, thank you for the invite, and thank you for um, uh, allowing us to speak. I will share my screen, and uh, I will get straight into the presentation for you. Go with me. So, can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, but brilliant. It's, but it's not running. It's just, uh, yeah, okay. No, that's okay. Okay, so brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Just to uh, introduce myself, uh, my name is Mark Parkinson. I'm the head of analysis for the Metropolitan Police, and I cover our digital intelligence and um, our specialist areas, so our, our serious and organised crime, our covert areas. Um, and, a, and a number of different areas. Um, I've been with the Metropolitan Police for 23 years, um, started off as a, a, a frontline intelligence analyst, uh, crime analyst, and, and have worked my way up to, to be the head of analysis. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so future and in, 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 uh, uh, current challenges for, for analysts. And I think before we understand why and, and what those challenges are, I think we really need to understand what analysts do. So crime analysts, and you know, a number of people have spoken today and really highlighted the importance of, of crime analysts to, to investigations and, and law enforcement. Um, I may be slightly biased uh, because I've been an intelligence analyst for such a long time, but, but crime analysts uh, are some of the most important people within law enforcement and within policing and, and within security um, it, it is the analyst who is that tool for modern policing, and it is that analyst who, who gathers information, who interrogates information, who, who interprets data and conducts that and forms um, information in such a way that, that we can make decisions and resource decisions and investigative decisions. So that analyst and, and that intelligence plays a huge crucial role in, in our landscape of law enforcement. Um, analysts enable the identification of, of threats. We, we and, I, and I class us as, as we, the raw we, who, who we are, large amounts of multi-source data and uh, data sets and techniques that we use to look at that information, interpret that information, whether we're using software or whether we're using our our critical thinking skills. I mean, I, I, I put it down on this slide. I mean, simply put, an intelligence analyst takes complex pieces Mark, of information. Mark, sorry yes? to sorry to jump in. Um, we don't see your slide at the moment. Oh, I do think you, not? you might have to stop um, stop presenting and then start again. It's just a grey screen. Apologise. Let me just see which one it is. And I have a few. We saw the PowerPoint, and then when you started presentation, it didn't show anything. Yes, we see it now. Does it come up now? Yes, yes, perfect. Oh, thank you. Um, You're welcome. So yeah, so as I was saying, it, 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 you know, simply put, intelligence and, and crime analysts take take very very complex pieces of information. Uh, data, intelligence, and present them in a context which is easy to understand. Our role is to enable effective decision making towards that investigation and, and, and towards that threat. So whether it's crime prevention or whether it's uh, the investigation of a crime, um, the, the analyst plays a vital, vital role. Um, analysts protect individuals, they protect organisations, they protect communities, they protect law enforcement. They, they protect everyone. Um, the intelligence uh, is actionable, whether it's on a strategic and operational or tactical uh, um, perspective. And, and analysts use data to make data-driven decisions uh, within their different agencies. So 
you sort of see where I'm coming from. In, intelligence analysts are, are incredibly important. Um, so I have a video, I have a very, very short video, which to me is, we, we used as one of our recruitment videos, but to me, it sort of highlights the type of work that an analyst does, the type of threats that we look at um, and the things that we're responsible for. So I'm hoping it will come onto the screen. So I hope that gives you a, a, an idea of, of, of sort of some of the things that we do as, as sort of analysts, which I think you know, everyone will be well and, and truly aware of, but it's, it's really just to um, instill how important analysts are. But with that importance comes huge, huge challenges. So you know, over the last sort of 10 to 12 years, we've had a massive change in the way that we, lives our, we live our lives. Um, how we communicate, how we pay our bills, how we um, just go ab about our day-to-day -day business, how we watch the news, how we uh, look at sort of social media, personal information and where that is stored. And, and on top of that, how, com uh, how crime is committed and, and how others are using different forms of smart technology and smart devices and the internet to, to um, um, carry out their criminality. Most people who are um, here today sort of listening to these wonderful presentations will have a uh, smartphone, one of these. Um, there is more power in one of our smartphones now that took um, the astronauts to the moon and, and you can understand the type of data that is within that device. So recent studies have, have sort of suggested that about 93% of UK adults, uh, so those in the United Kingdom, will have a smartphone, a, a smart telephone, by next year. Um, you can understand the, the sort of unmanageable demand that, that places on law enforcement who are not that well equipped to deal with that volumes of data and that complexity of data. Um, technology. And, and we hear this all the time, and we hear this every single year. Technology is advancing quicker than any time in our history. Um, when I was a child, I think my father said that to me. Technology is, you know, it's advancing quicker. And it, and it still is. And, and next year, it will be advancing even quicker. And the year after, it would be advancing quicker. And no longer are we standing still in, in any sort of technological forum, whilst we as law enforcement and, and crime analysts can catch up. It is constantly evolving and constantly moving. You know, how we store information, secure access to devices. Um, getting into devices is increasingly difficult. You don't just switch them on and you can, and you can get in. You, you have passcodes, you have biometrics, you have you know, eye scanners, facial scanners, fingerprint uh, uh, sort of scanners. End-to-end -end encryption. And end-to-end -end encryption is uh, really interesting because it goes beyond things like WhatsApp. Um, and, and other sort of uh, app-based uh, communications. Um, EncroChat is, is one of the you know, prime examples of end-to-end -end encryption of where criminality is using um, technology to, to enable their criminality and enable uh, uh, their drug market, their, their human trafficking market, the, the firearms and, and illegal weapons market. Um, 
data, for example, is, is no longer located in, in one location. We, we download data from a particular portal. We don't know if that server that we're downloading on is in the middle of the Far East or in Malaysia or in the United States or in France or in Germany or, or the UK. Sometimes they can be in all of those places because these days, Amazon, for example, have, have data hubs all the way across the world and your data may not be stored in your home country. It may be stored halfway across the world. The, these are extreme challenges for us because extracting that data, we're then dealing with legislation, legislation of different countries and, and you know, different environments. And, you know, how do we get hold of that information and, and, and go over those thresholds and, and cope with the advances in technology? With understandably, law enforcement and policing have limited powers uh, to be able to get into locked devices and, and encrypted devices. And it, becomes in, in incredibly difficult. Social media, social media is incredible. Um, you know, 15 years ago, it was quite small. Today, it's the biggest thing. Um, you know, 20 years ago, the richest people in the world were the oil barons and the, you know, the, the utilities people of the world. Today, it's data. Those people who own data, you know, the Elon Musks of the world who, who own data, um, they're, they're that's where everything is. And that's how the changing ways of criminals and terrorists connections, communications around social media, simply using WhatsApp to, to contact each other, um, sending a message over Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat, it, you know, it's incredible. Um, but with that data becomes massive, massive challenges, you know, data volumes, different types and variety of data using software packages to be able to understand that data. Downloading that data, you need a template to understand you know, how that data is made up to be able to then manipulate it, put it through a system. Um, huge challenges. Um, but one of the biggest challenges around data is data quality. And, and this is really important within law enforcement and within police forces uh, and, and security agencies is our data is probably one of the worst out there. Um, sometimes we can't even get the victim names and the victim data correct. We, you know, we spell surnames wrong, telephone numbers, cell numbers, um, email addresses we, we get wrong. If we, if we can't get our victim data correct, how are we ever expected to, you know, to, to help our victims and help the community? And this is a real massive issue of compliance and it's and it's officer compliance and data compliance of putting stuff within system correctly um huge huge challenges and and, it, and again another huge challenge to to crime analysts is expectations and demand you know i'll, I'll bet there's no one out there who, who works for um a crime analyst unit an intelligence unit who will say they have enough analysts or they have enough intelligence officers um to meet their demand um, the demand for analysts is huge and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger because whilst analysts show the worth that they are, more people want to use analysts. So we're almost a victim of our own success, but actually with that carries great risk. That, that outstripping, outstripping capacity, which risk do we have to say no to? It's, uh, it's extremely challenging. This is just an example of, of that chaotic data landscape that we're, that we're sort of dealing with. You know, crime analyst sits in the middle whilst all of that information is, is spinning around them from, from different systems, from different apps, from different data sources. It's, you know, it's hugely incredible how much uh, is really out there. I mean, just a few facts for you. You, you. 218 billion apps were downloaded in 2021, which is almost a 7% increase on the previous year. That increase is set to double every single year. So, you know, almost 14% and then 28%. It, it's, it's absolutely huge. A year ago, on average, people used to spend in the UK about four hours on their phone. That has now gone up to almost four and a half, uh, almost five hours a day on their phone. Um, again, huge, huge changes in our lifestyle and, and, and sort of what we do. 66% um, of people have changed how they use technology to combat loneliness. And this is largely around COVID and, and how COVID has, 
really affected the world and, and drawn people behind one of these computer screens or behind a, a, a telephone. Um, 1500 apps released uh, every single day. And again, with each of those apps, you can, you can imagine the data that sits behind it. Um, and in the UK, they estimate that 98% of young people aged between 16 to 24 will have a smartphone. And again, we, with our drugs county lines um, spinning around through the country and, and through Europe, um, everyone uses a, a smartphone to conduct that business. This is, a, this is an image that one of our um, colleagues put together of us as analysts. Uh, he drew this himself, which I think was, uh, I needed to show this off because it, it was a fantastic picture. But um, we sit in the middle as intelligence analysts in that search engine, in, in our central hubs and, and, and sort of focusing, drawing in and sucking in all that information to then provide those products which go into the investigation system and the, and, uh, the proactive operations so that we can give advice to, to law enforcement and the court, we can help with interviews and ultimately we can bring people to justice. Um, I thought I'd just demonstrate that to you. Where are we in the Met Police? This is us today. 600 independent systems. We've got a huge lack of information culture. We're behind the information age. We don't really store and index our information as we should do. We have analytics, but I wouldn't say we have advanced analytics. We've got pockets of advanced analytics, but not across the board, across everyone. We work in silos. We, we don't really have the knowledge of what we actually know inside the Met Police. I could probably change that Met Police to any other law enforcement agency or any other organization, and it's probably the same. But where do we want to be? The future brings us to innovation and collaboration, dynamic intelligence-led policing, which is really has a crime analyst right in the center, right in the middle data-driven, integrated intelligence systems, advanced analytics, real-time intelligence, automation. These are the things that are gonna bring us into the future. And these are the things that are gonna make our crime analysts stand out from anyone else and help us fight crime and organize crime from here on in. So again, one of our future challenges, we, we know what the current challenges are, but future challenges is, for us in the UK and especially in policing, it's confidence and trust by the public. Um, many people around the world would have seen the media, we've seen the news reports of one of our police officers in the Met Police who murdered Sarah Everard. Um, some of the messages and the, and the criminal behavior of some of the officers and, and also some of the civilians. And, and this goes across law enforcement. And with that, we have real confidence issues in our public. And if our public don't trust us, to do the job, how can we do the job? So it's a real challenge for us. Um, world events, world events have, have you know, a huge impact everywhere, um, not just in law enforcement, but, but across every community and across the cost of living and, and everything. But with those, with those world events, so whether it's terrorism, whether it's war, whether it's climate change and, and, and sort of global warming and, and disease and, and transnational organized crime, that, that brings with it a huge area of challenge. The, the war in Ukraine has opened up people coming into Europe and the Ukraine under the guise of being um, migrants um, fleeing war. Organized criminals have, have taken to that and used that to their advantage and taken people out and used them for criminal purpose. Um, our surveillance society, we're, you know, balancing the benefits of risk against, you know, emerging um, sort of surveillance society. How many cameras do we really want? But actually, with those cameras, we can use those cameras and devices to be able to track down that criminal behaviour. Um, further changes in, 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 in behaviours, encryption. Um, the interesting thing is when... When news broke out of uh, um, the the EncroChat server having been um, sort of looked at, and and you know the world of encrypted communications devices, a lot of law enforcement agencies thought actually that's it from here on in. The one thing they didn't consider is actually people going back to basics, people now talking to each other and actually meeting up. So that's where. 
we get a completely different challenge, which isn't based on data, which isn't based on, on technology, which is actually based on that face-to-face -face conversation, which some of us almost have stopped having after COVID because everything is done by a screen and, and, and computers. Um, social media, technology, changes in drugs markets, um, data analytics. Data analytics has changed so much over the last five or six years and even 10 years. We become digital focused. You know, everything is about digitization. Everything is about numbers and how we store information. I go back to, you know, those people in the world who've made their successes through data because the data that some of these organizations hold is incredible and how we store that and how we make it accessible is changing our whole way of life. We have um, apps like Deliveroo, Just Eat, um, you know, things that not only tell you how many salads and burgers you've eaten every single week, but they'll tell you your exact location. They'll tell you, you know, your lifestyle, your habit, but they'll overlay that with Strava and, and other Google-based um, apps. And with that, it's incredibly powerful about pinpointing where individuals are. So when we have a shooting in London, you know, we are able in some shape or form to try and have a look at devices and see who potentially was around that we, we would know. Um, data governance and data assurance is, is, again, it's around legislation. Do we know what information we've got? Do we review that information? Do we have a retention policy? And actually, do we delete that information? Do we need to keep that information? Um, a lot of law enforcement agencies say we'll keep everything. We want to keep everything. But actually, sometimes that's going to hinder you because is that information relevant? Or actually, is it going to throw you off in another direction, which you don't want to do? So, so again, having a review or retention and deletion policy is incredibly uh, important. Biometrics, software, um, recruitment, recruitment of staff and recruitment of analysts uh, are, are incredibly challenging. We recruit them in, we train them up. They go to the banking industry, the financial industry, they go to sort of other services. Um, we can put up with a certain element of, of attrition, but it becomes a huge challenge and very, very expensive to us of where we, we train up our staff and our, our, our crime analysts to a certain degree, but then they leave because they get a better offer because they're getting paid more. Um, so it's that public sector versus private sector uh, and sort of staff retention um, sort of piece. But I just want to finish it off um, just really quickly because one of the things we always forget is actually looking after our people. So one of the things I pride, I pride myself on within the Metropolitan Police is having staff wellbeing and people's health uh, uh, at the front of our mind. If we don't look after our people, they won't look after us and they won't do their job properly. Um, Richard Branson once famously said, if you, want to, if you want your customers to be happy, you need to treat your staff right, because if you treat your staff right, they will treat your customers right. And, and it's no different in any organization or even in law enforcement. We, we need to look after our staff. COVID has taught us a lot about flexible working, being agile in the way that we work. Prior to COVID, even I would say there was never a chance that I would allow a crime analyst to work at home on, on some of the issues and some of the data that we've got. But actually, we were forced to do that with COVID. And it's proved to me and it's proved to my colleagues and it's proved to a number of people that it's possible. It's manageable. You just need to have some safeguards in place and manage that situation and, and ensure you speak to your staff and, and, and set those ground rules. And that does a huge amount for work-life balance, mental health, caring responsibilities, family obligations, and uh, you, you, it, it goes a huge way to be flexible and support the needs of, of our people who will ultimately perform for us. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just gonna leave you on, on, on sort of that and, and sort of tie up now. I know we're, we're sort of running out of time, but I just wanna say thank you. Those are my details. Um, Mark Parkinson, Mark Parkinson at met.police.uk. Please feel free to email me, call me, send me a message, um, and and let me know if there's any way that I can help you um, at any time. Um, um, yeah, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh...
Mark, uh, that was really a great presentation. Far away from that, what we have seen before, but giving us uh, yeah uh, many many things to think about that what you were talking about, um, and I'm pretty sure uh, the way uh, you uh, described the, our challenges, what we have now, and also for the near future. It's the same all over the world in Western countries, uh, and we have to handle that, uh, which is really a, a big challenge, and it will not work uh, uh, without the help also of our decision makers. So once again, uh, we, we are challenged with the problem that we have to convince our decision makers uh, to find uh, the right way uh, so we we can develop ourselves into uh, a better life and also uh, a better work. So I really appreciate your speech. And as I already know, you will be one of the first who said yes to come to Malta for a live event, there. which is great. And I'm pretty sure not only Andreas and his team, also the students will will highly appreciate that when you'll be there for discussions. And I'm also sure that many, many uh, decision makers, we will invite them, will take the opportunity to talk with you about uh, all the things you, you, you presented us now. Thank you again. Uh, Thank you. Let's stay tuned. Uh, and now I'm handed over to the last, but not least, no, the least, but the last, anyway. <laughs> Stefan Meyer, uh, give me one minute to introduce this uh, handsome guy to you guys. Uh, Stefan Meyer is one of my colleagues uh, working at the central headquarter uh, in Vienna. Uh, he is my personal trainer and teacher for geographic stuff, especially geotime. Uh, and I'm more than happy to call him a friend because I can call him late at night if I run into some issues or whenever. Uh, he always helped me out. He's a great guy. He's uh, one of the best in my country working with uh, uh, geotime stuff uh, to solve uh, crime, especially very serious crime. Yeah, Stefan, it's so great to have you on board here. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Sam. Hello, everybody. My name is Stefan Meyer, and I'm very pleased to present today here at this very first event at the EACA. And Sammy, you're right. You you often call me, and sometimes at night at your night shift at my home. But that doesn't matter. That's okay for me. I'm happy to help you. So um, maybe some of uh, the audience will also know me from other events in Europe, or maybe from an IACA conference in America some years ago. I'm police officer in Vienna since 29 years. Since 10 years, I changed to the field of crime analy analysis. And six years ago, I joined the Austrian Criminal Intelligence Service. Uh, we say Bundeskriminalamt Österreich. I'm specialized in geographic analysis, where, where I mostly work with uncharted products like Geotime Desktop and Geotime Enterprise. You will see in a few minutes. I analyze call detail records, uh, wiretapping data, cell phone extractions, GPS tracking devices, and so on. Simply every device that produces time and location. This data can be put on a map, and you will see that not only the location on the map is important, but also the time of the event and how you can present these events. I work a lot on homicide cases to assist the investigators in drawing a pattern of life from the suspect and often also from the victim. This helps them to understand what happened and maybe show the difference between normal days and the time after the night of murder. 
but let's jump into this case. I show you, I want to show you today. All right. Present my screen here. I hope you can see this. Uh, this is a Geotime desktop. You can see um, a split view where on the left side, uh, this is a normal 2D view, uh, like you can see it on um, maybe Google Maps or ArcGIS. And on the right side, it's a 3D view uh, where you can see the same, the exact same data, but uh, the, the third dimension is the time that went by. And so uh, in this case, we can see right now about one week of data where uh, on the left side, you, you couldn't see where the, uh, the suspect or the victim, or we don't know right now, um, is uh, where he has the locations most of the time. But on the right side, you, you can see it with one view and that's the, the good thing uh, about geotime. So, but normally I do not use this camera rock, like um, the, this moving 3D view here. This is only for you that you can get a better feeling for the data. Uh, and in the meanwhile, I want to uh, show you, uh, tell you the, the story behind this case. So, um, there is a, a father that, that was very concerned about his daughter who was in the mid twenties and she was living on her own in a small flat in Vienna. He found the dead body of his strangled daughter in her apartment. She didn't reply for several days and that was not normal for her. So uh, that's why he was, uh, he went to her place and she must have been lying dead in her apartment for several days. And the investigators searched for traces at the crime scene like DNA and fingerprints and so on. He also asked the providers for the call detail records of the victim and wanted to make a cell phone extraction of her phone. But they didn't find the phone they also didn't find her ATM card. These two items were stolen. So the crime looked a little bit like a home invasion or maybe a robbery. Nevertheless, all family members and friends had to be hurt by the police. Um, so, um, Sorry, one moment. Um, yeah, so uh, one, uh, maybe one or two days later, also the, the boyfriend of her uh, had to come to the police station and he, he, he said uh, different things at different times. So, and these things didn't fit together because uh, he said um, he last uh, met her um, uh, one week ago. And then he said, yeah, but uh, she, she was at his house uh, some, some days ago. So that didn't fit together. And so uh, he stopped talking and the investigator said, okay, we, we want to make a house search at your apartment. And he said, uh, okay, sure, let's go. And then they found uh, her uh, cell phone and also her uh, ATM card at his apartment. So um, after that, uh, my part started here because I got the cell, uh, the cell phone data of his cell phone and also of, of her cell phone. 
and I got the call detail records I want to show you now. So let's go stop the split view. I also don't want the camera rock. So uh, now we can see this is only her CDR data, her call detail records. What we can see here, uh, uh, most of the data is in Vienna. And we can see here, uh, um, I, I call it a tower of data. Mo most of the data is at the exact same location. It's her home location because uh, where you live, you, you spend most of the time. And so you, you do all uh, um, most of the communication. Uh, where you live. Uh, there's another um, smaller tower. It's at the workplace. You, you can see here. And we can see something interesting. When I uh, decrease the, the time span that, that we look at, we can see this is the tower of her home. But uh, the events stop here. And then the last events are at this place. And of course, I, I know this case and I know that this place is his home address. So it, uh, it was really interesting that all the data before was only at her address and never at his address. I can show you this a little bit better. When we move exactly to his house, it is somewhere here. Then we can see, okay, the, in the last week, her data is only here at his address. And if I increase the time span, we can see she never was at this location before. That's That's very interesting. So, when we look at the call detail records of her boyfriend, then we can see two towers. This is his home address. And the second tower here is the address of, is her home address. And we do not see any work address. So we, we know that he was not working. He was just at home or at her place. So, and when we combine these two types of data, then we can see the exact same as before. And the interesting thing is when she stopped uh, producing data at her place, uh, the only data was produced at his place. So next, I got from the investigators the Google location history from his cell phone. I could also import it into GeoTime here. Then we can see a lot more events here. But it is more or less the, the same pattern of life like his um, call detail records. We have a big tower of events here. And we have also a lot of events here at her place. And when we combine this with um, his call details, and I decrease the time span once again, then we can see Every time when a call detail record, the, the big red dots here, uh, and I can make again a different um, color. When we see the, the big dots here, then we always see there is also the Google location data here. So we see exactly when he's moving and when he makes telephone calls. And it's the, the same behavior as before, just with the Google location history, we 
we see much more in detail where he, where we where he exactly moved. Okay, now, but let's let's go to the to the last data that that is really interesting. So um, I have prepared this here. So um, we are at the exact position where her apartment is. It's the, the blue uh, cross here. And we can see here that if I move the time very slowly, you can see at this night, this guy is moving to her place. Then the, the time is moving by some hours and some hours later, he's leaving back to his home. So at this night, he, he comes here about 10 o'clock and at the evening and moves back to his home at five o'clock in the morning. So let's, let's see what, what we know from the investigators, what they found out and what we can see here in this data. We can see here when, when he came, he didn't go exactly to her place. He went to uh, this place here. And if I show you this one, these two uh, met at this, at the Starboys lounge here at this bar. So this is uh, where they met at the evening to take some drinks. And uh, um, she also made some pictures here. And I can show you the picture. Uh, one of these pictures were these here, where we can see uh, the victim and the suspect and the bartender having a good time at the bar. And when, when we look uh, what happens then, then we can see, I scroll down once again, um, about uh, some minutes after midnight, we can see his data moving to the exact position of her home. So uh, they too went at her home. And then we see he's going back, back to the bar just for some minutes and then coming back here. So he told us, and also the, the bartender told us the, the same thing, that he um, forgot his jacket in the bar and he went back, back to, the bar, uh, to the bar and um, took his jacket and came back to the apartment to his girlfriend. And then we see he's here some hours, but of course we, we don't know exactly what happened here, but um, we looked at the chat messages from his phone and uh, from her phone, and we saw some very interesting data, especially when you know that uh, these two guys had uh, a fight, some weeks ago and um, from, from this fight on uh, the, the text messages between him and her were like, when he writes, honey, I love you. What are you doing tonight? And she writes, just died, going to bed. And then he writes, oh, honey, I love you so much. Want to meet tomorrow? And she writes, I don't know, let's see. So. He was always um, showing his heart and she was always very cold uh, to him. But at this, uh, some, some minutes later when he came back from the bar, there was the, the first, um, let's say very suspicious um, text message where her, I, I would say her, telephone, um, or a text message was written on her telephone. I, I don't think that she was it that wrote that message. And she wrote to another friend and said, um, 
Um, I'm sorry what happened. It was a mistake. I love him so much. Uh, better leave me alone. And two minutes later, there were text messages between uh, these, these two here, the, the boyfriend and the girlfriend. And these messages were, um, I, I love you, honey. We belong together for a lifetime. This was what he wrote to her. But she wrote back the next minute, I love you too, honey. We belong together for a lifetime. So um, after weeks of uh, fighting and, and being cold to him, she, she writes, I love you so much and, and we belong together for a lifetime. So that, that doesn't fit together. And, uh, but from this minute on, uh, or from this night on, the, the next two days, uh, all these messages were sent between these two guys. But there was an, another interesting uh, message from her phone to another friend. It said, um, I'm sorry, I forgot my uh, pin code for the ATM card. Do, do you remember that? And the, the guy wrote back, yes, it's called uh, 12345. So uh, what we could see one hour later when the suspect was, was going to this place here where he um, met a bold taxi and drove home just a few minutes before, we, we could see he uh, went into a bank and uh, went to a cash machine. And you, you can see here, this is the guy and he's holding a ATM uh, card in his hand. And from this cash machine, he took all the money from the account of his girlfriend. And then he went home. This is the, now you can see, this is when he took the bolt taxi and went home again. And then we can see uh, the, the same data as I showed you at the beginning. This is the suspicious night and the, the last driving home. And from this day on, in the next seven days, he's only at home. And he, he just went out one time to, to buy something, I don't know. But uh, he's only at home and, and waiting for something to happen. And of course, uh, the first thing that, that happened after two days of writing with his and her uh, cell phone, uh, her uh, battery ran low. So after that, um, we, we only can see this uh, triangle um, icons here. This means that there is no position for her cell phone. It's just shut off and nobody could reach her. And uh, some days later, her dead body was found. And some days later, the police called him and said, uh, we want to ask you some questions. Could you please come to our office? And this is the, the last movement that we have here when this guy is moving to the uh, police station where he was arrested. And uh, yeah, and this is the, the interesting thing that, that we could show the, the movement where he wanted to make a, for him a perfect alibi that he, he know he was at, the, at this night here and but he he wanted to uh, show that uh, she is still alive and and her body should be found maybe one week later or many days later and so that that's why he wrote messages not only to his uh, cell phone but also to other friends and also to her family and she always uh, he always wrote, 
um, I'm not I'm not feeling too good. Um, I'm a little bit sick, so uh, you don't have to come to visit me. Um, I'm fine. Just just leave me alone some days. But um, yeah, in, in this alibi uh, combined with that data uh, was not very good. So uh, at court, he got a lifetime imprisonment for for this murder. And yeah, I, I think I'm at the end of my presentation. Sammy, do you have some questions or anybody else? Um, uh, someone asked me of the, the phone's location where uh, do you, do you, do you, the phone uh, location you used, uh, where they uh, been uh, created because uh, he made calls or, or sending test, text messages or where these locations coming from pings? Um, we, we have two types of uh, data for for his movement. Uh, first, we, we have the, the big red dots. This is call detail record that is generated when he makes phone calls. Uh, but this is not so often. Most of the people use uh, internet like uh, or text messages like Viber, WhatsApp, uh, Signal, and so on. And in here in Austria, we we get from the providers only when they use their phone for calling. Uh, when they use it with um, with the internet, with um, network, um, and and they use uh, WhatsApp, then. The only chance we have is that these apps like Google, for example, uh, creates also locations in, inside of the cell phone. And when we get the cell phone and, and uh, can contact maybe Google or other app, apps that they used, then we get this cloud data. And this is, these are all the, the small, dots that you can see here. And this is much more accurate than cell phone data. Is this answer enough for you? Um, Sammy, we cannot hear you. Yes, that's great. Uh, uh, the question was coming from Jose Aurelio. And uh, if you have any additional questions, Jose, uh, just let me know and I will forward it to, to Stefan uh, or bring you guys together so you can talk about that case and, 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 and all the things behind. Yes, uh, Stefan, uh, once again, uh, a great thank you for these presentations. Uh, I know this is not the only one major case you solved with. Uh, your work and uh, I really appreciate that you were, will, were willing to present that stuff. So many thanks uh, once again. And now this brings me to the very end. Uh, yes, guys, uh, that's it for today. Uh, hopefully we, we will meet us again in the near future because we are planning so many uh, events for, for the next month. Stay tuned, use the opportunity of on our website, uh, especially in the forum, uh, asking questions, uh, also uh, share your experience. Um, yeah, whatever you want to know, whatever you, you uh, think you have to say, just uh, use the, the platform. And uh, yet, if you guys think uh, that's not enough for me uh, to be a member, I want to be more, I want to be uh, actively involved in this association, let me know. At the moment, 
Uh, we are only a handful of people handling it, uh, and we would love to have you on board uh, for many, many, many uh, things to, to be done. Uh, give you an example. Uh, we would love to find people who are uh, confident in uh, handling Joomla for a website uh, programming. Uh, we would love to have people being responsible for uh, video conferences, for, for everything. Uh, let me know. It's a brand new association, as mentioned before, and it would be great that it's not only me and a handful of other people to work on that. This association uh, lives with you and for you. And if you want to be actively involved, this is your chance uh, to be there, uh, to be on board. Let me know. Let us know if you want to be involved. Uh, some uh, uh, things at the end. Let me check my, my notes. So I don't forget anything. Yes, we are planning a big uh, uh, event in person uh, coming up next year in, in, on the island of Malta, hosted by the European Forensic Institute. It would be it will be a great event. Uh, stay tuned uh, for details. Uh, we will uh, publish them in the next weeks. There is also a. a a major event for, for Europe uh, uh, being hosted by the Danish National Police. Uh, uh, responsible is my friend Jakob Lindegar from the Danish Police. Uh, it's the European Crime Analysis Conference uh, being held uh, in Copenhagen from May uh, 31st to the 1st of June. So we will uh, inform you on our website about everything uh, what's coming up for this conference and maybe uh, we will meet us there. Um, at this point, I also want to say thank you so much for all these people who helped me from behind. Uh, Michelle, uh, which is uh, like I say, uh, straight translated from German, to English, she's our good ghost. I also want to say thank you to Alessia. She was always in the back, but handling all the technical stuff. And yes, uh, I also want to say thank you to my friend, uh, Andreas Melinato uh, and Andreas uh, for the very last words. Uh, the floor is yours. And uh, Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to work with you so close together. Uh, and please uh, say the last words to our audience. Yeah, well, thanks to you, Sam, and to, and to everybody, of course, all the panelists. They, it was a really a nice presentation, a really nice opening, and I'm sure there will be a lot of other opportunities for everybody. Thank you again. Thank you, Andreas. And yes, uh, my friends, that's it. And I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm committing a crime now, but I'm raising my beer uh, to you guys. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it because I have such a, a bad background uh, which cancels everything. But I'm now drinking a beer uh, for you guys. Uh, just to celebrate uh, this very first uh, online event. Um, and everyone who's still online, great. Thank you to you guys. And that's it for now. But stay tuned because the near future will bring some other stuff. And hopefully you will enjoy it. Uh, yeah. As great I job, can see Sam. Ra Rachel. Great I can job, Sam. <laughs> yeah, Rachel, I can see you uh, on my screen now and also Michelle, you both ladies are outstanding. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you <laughs> for taking the time uh, uh, to make my personal idea alive. It's like a newborn baby. <laughs> and 
I'm the father now, but I hopefully I can find some younger fathers to to ha to handle that stuff in the near future. Uh, I'm getting older and older, and maybe this was the really uh, first starting point uh, for making people uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, let's get uh, let's get some people addicted to this association, so I can step back one or two steps. To concentrate a little bit more for my on my new function as a director for the EFI. Uh, yes, many thanks again. Uh, have a great evening. Have a great day for those guys who are uh, on the other side of the world. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll see us soon, and hopefully also in person. Rachel, especially for you, I hope we see you in Malta. Sounds good to me. Thanks, Sam. As always, great job. Bye bye. Bye, bye everybody. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.